All right, let's go ahead and get started. My apologies. Uh, traffic from Denver had me a little stuck, so sorry for the delay. All right, let's go ahead and start the meeting. Let's open it up with roll call. Mayor Bagley. Here. Uh, Council Members Christensen. Here. Hidalgo Faring. Here. Uh, Martin. Here. Peck. Here. Rodriguez. Here. Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, let's say the pledge. All right, I don't see the city attorney or city manager down here, so there's nothing else, right? So we just launch right into it? All right, cool. Well, welcome to our public forum. Uh, the only night that we actually have the opportunity to have an interchange during, I guess it's not public invited to be heard, it's more of an interchange. So uh, what we'll do is uh, you'll have a five-minute time limit, so come up, ask your question, make your statement, whatever you want, and then uh, we'll have the opportunity to have a brief interchange or ex exchange. And uh, we'll go with that. So shall we start? Let us start. Um, is there any issues from councils before, council before we begin? All right. It looks like we've got Danielle Booth. What? Oh, was it Daniel Butler? My Sorry, Danielle Butler. My handwriting must be terrible. It's Danielle well, Butler. <laughs> but no, it it kind of looks like a... I can see it. We'll go yeah, with that. It's, it's yeah. very quick. Uh, Danielle Butler, I'm the executive director with the Early Childhood Council of Boulder County, uh, 1285 Centaur Village Drive, Lafayette, Colorado. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm here this evening um, to say thank you. Uh, short and sweet, but I wanted to thank you for undertaking a good look at early childhood issues in Longmont and for actually getting them on the um, into your strategic plan. We, we just need, oh. we need you to speak louder and get oh. right up in there like okay, this. Okay, right like this? Yep. Okay. Um, so, should I start from the beginning? Okay, so I'm sure. just, I'm here to say thank you. Um, I'm here to say thank you for undertaking a look at early childhood issues in Longmont and for um, creating goals in your strategic plan and also for considering funding them and going ahead and funding them for 2020, 21, and 22. Um, I think that this was some um, far-reaching thinking that you've done. Not all communities do this. Uh, with the Early Childhood Council, I work with a lot of people across Boulder County. We have 13 board members. We have 20, over 25 advisory council members. We um, have been invited and participate in the Longmont City Council um, Human Services Bright Eyes Committee that looks at early childhood issues. And um, I can just tell you we're all really excited and really proud of Longmont and Boulder County for putting some dollars behind early childhood initiatives. So our birth to fives in the community aren't always seen. Um, they're often invisible. We see their parents, but their parents are really working. Um, so their voices aren't always heard, and it takes an extra effort to pay attention. Um, you guys did, and it came to my intention that, um, that it might be nice if you heard that, that sometimes you don't hear those sort of things, um, feedback on, on what you've done. So um, I trust there's going to be more good news coming. I understand that your staff um, are looking at evidence-based programs to fund with this money. So I can assure you that they're, those are around. They're successful. They're in the community. And um, children and families are going to be served. So anyway, thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, Julia Rush. Oh, sorry. Did you? I'm sorry. Yes. Julia, hold on one second. Council, or sorry. Danielle, can you hold on one second? Because we had questions from council. It's not really a question. I just yeah. wanted to let everybody know that segueing on what you're saying is that um, January 30th, next week, we are going to have at the uh, Longmont Museum from... Um, from the National League of Cities, a film called No Small Matter. You must have heard of that. Oh, yes, we've been invited. Yes. Hooray. We 
So I, I would just like to extend that invitation. It is a film that um, stresses the importance of birth to, pre, to preschool and how you, that a child learns from the moment it is born and how we can interact to prepare them for preschool. So I invite everybody to come 6 to 8 at the Longmont Museum on January 30th. That's just another example of some of the innovative and wonderful things you're doing. Uh, this community also hosted um, Mike Butler, your chief safety officer, brought to town and hosted uh, Dr. Bruce Perry in November. So those things are really, really important, and they don't happen everywhere. So please, you know, pat on the back to everybody. All right, thank you. All right, now Julia Rush, sorry. And then... Are we, Michelle, do we have another sheet, or is this it? Okay, cool. If, if could somebody grab it? Let me lower this. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Good evening, Council Mayor. My name is Julia Rush. I live at two two zero three Barnswallow Drive. I am the board president of the Our Center. In November, I forwarded to you concerns that I had relating to communication I received from Councilman Peck and Councilman, Councilwoman Polly Christensen. Since that time, there's been a lot of discussion about how that complaint was handled, whether or not that complaint should have been made, should have been kept secret from the public, and discourse between council members. But there's been little to no discussion about the communication that I actually received. In October, the Our Center, after careful review by the new executive director and a new board, decided to put in an application to Boulder County to continue our navigation services under coordinated entry. That service contract is administered by Boulder County. Longmont City Council does not have say in how that's awarded. Almost immediately after that decision was made and before it was public, I received a phone call from Councilwoman Peck and emails from Polly Christensen opposing our Boulder County RFP application. I'm not gonna rehash that communication here. That was a part of my detailed complaint and you have those emails. Despite statements denying that the communication was threatening, I felt threatened by it. And I felt that there was significant effort put into making sure that those threats were kept secret. I've lost countless nights of sleep worrying about whether or not these two councilwomen were going to cut our funding from the city of Longmont because we chose to compete for funding from another government agency in competition with an organization that they privately support. No organization should feel threatened by this council. We are very encouraged by your willingness to hold an ethics meeting, but we want some assurances that the underlying issue will be formally addressed. All Longmont social service charities should be assured that the budgeting process is open and transparent, and advocacy for individual charities is open and free of conflicts of interest. If you sit on an advocacy committee or a board for a charity in your private life that you may have a hand in funding in your public life, that needs to be disclosed to the public. This committee has recently demonstrated appropriate advocacy in its handling of funding awarded to El Comité. It was openly discussed in this forum, and there was absolutely no question about the honorable motives of the councilwoman who advocated for it. She appropriately disclosed her involvement and advocacy for that charity. That could be a model for advocacy on this council going forward. This is a self-regulating body, and as such, it has a duty to address my complaint separate and apart from whatever decision is made by the district attorney. I hope you'll take that duty seriously. It does not serve this community to set up a system that encourages social services charities to cultivate secret relationships with individual council members. There have been several questions by this council about who our organization serves and what we do. We provided an extensive Longmont services application that outlined several of our services. However, I would encourage each of you to visit our facility in your official capacity. Come to one of our monthly Coffee for a Cause meetings open to the public and learn about what we do. We are more than willing to answer your questions and concerns. 
Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Uh, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Ms. Rush. Um, can you tell us a little more about the process that you entered with Boulder County? Was it a procurement process where you had to build, uh, provide an application and uh, entered into a, a competitive process based on your application? Yes, it was. Were the um, applications meant to be confidential? They were. Were the, were the roster of bidders meant to be confidential? In other words, was the public allowed to know who was competing for the funding? You know, I don't know that. I don't have that information. I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks. Nobody else is in the queue. Thank okay. you, Ms. Rush. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Mark Cowell. Uh, Mark Cowell, 1297 Matthews Way in Erie, uh, Mayor Bagley, uh, members of City Council. I'm the Executive Director for the Hour Center. Um, Joseph Sandovich, the Executive Director for HOPE, wanted to be here with me this evening, but unfortunately he had a family commitment and couldn't join me. Um, so as a result, uh, we, uh, because he couldn't join me at the podium, we've crafted a written statement that I'd like to read to the Council right now. In the past several months, the Hour Center and HOPE have repeatedly been asked, why can't the Hour Center, why can't HOPE get along? Why can't we work together? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We have been. Despite the issues brought to the light by the Hour Center Board of Directors and the ensuing public and private discussions, our two organizations continue to collaborate and seek ways to strengthen our partnerships moving into the future. For example, HOPE is taking the lead in this year's Point in Time Homeless Survey. Um, it is their goal that this year's efforts yield the most comprehensive and accurate count for our community done to date. Hope staff reached out to the Hour Center and asked if we'd be willing to be a magnet site for families and if we would reach out to our volunteer base for assistance on this project. Without hesitation, we agreed to support Hope in any way that was beneficial to their efforts. Joseph and I continue to meet on a regular basis to explore how our organizations can work together and we can support each other's missions. Because at the end of the day, we both want the same goals. We want to end homelessness and we want to help individuals and families go from just trying to survive in our community to actually thriving in our community. Additionally, we've received many questions asking what it is, what do we do, what does our organizations do for the community? Well, the Our Center was founded in 1986 by a group of faith-based leaders that recognized that those in need were turning to the local churches for help. Those churches agreed that unifying community resources would ultimately provide better help to those in need and also give the church and community members a consistent place to refer folks. Out of that realization grew the Outreach United Resource Center, as you know, at the Our Center. Since the mid-80s, a lot has changed, and unfortunately, the issues of affordable housing, homelessness, and food insecurities, um, just to name a few, have not only grown in scale, but also in complexity. There is no one single factor resulting in homelessness or resulting in the negative impacts on the other social determinants of health, nor is there any one single solution to these issues or one organization that can provide all the services and supports to address these issues. As a result, in the past couple years, the Hour Center has shifted its focus more towards families, and that is because there are more great safety net organizations in our community, such as HOPE. But I want to be clear, too, that this shift doesn't mean that the Hour Center will not work with single adults or that we've turned our back on the homeless. We're in a very unique position. Not only can we provide supports to the homeless community, but as a family resource center, we can provide resources and referrals to a variety of households in our community. Last year alone, we provided $346,705 in direct financial assistance to families and individuals in our community. Most of that was rent and utilities. We also provided over 80,000 hot meals and distributed 996,403 pounds of food back out to the community. Despite our best efforts, the individuals and families may still become homeless. HOPE continues to fill this gap for adults, adult individuals who are experiencing homelessness. HOPE offers year-round sheltering as part of their HSBC navigation program that helps people get back on their feet. 
Hope Shelter also provides emergency sheltering for the community during the coldest winter nights. And Hope continues to provide street outreach throughout the city on a weekly basis, engaging the most vulnerable citizens and referring them to organizations like the Hour Center when they are in need of assistance that Hope is unable to provide. Together in 2019, through the navigation program, Hope and the Hour Center were able to successfully house 51 individuals, reunite another 60 with family and friends, and this year we're already looking at ways to collaborate on a family-focused safe lot for those who are living in their vehicles in our community. So Joseph and I would like to invite not only the members of the city council, but also members of the public to come visit our organizations, see our programs in action, meet our professional dedicated staff, come ask all the questions that you want to know about our organizations. At the Hour Center, I'd like to personally invite each and every one of you to a Coffee for a Cause. Um, our next one is February 5th, but we hold it every other month. Um, and if you'd rather have a more personal one-on-one, -on -one, I'm more than happy to sit down with anyone or any group one-on-one -on -one and answer any questions um, and discuss the future of the Hour Center and how we partner with organizations like Hope. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilor Mayor Peck. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that uh, letter to yes. us. I appreciate it. I have been uh, to coffee with uh, at the Hour Center, mm -hmm. and really appreciate them. And uh, have worked with the the youth on trick or treat for the homeless, where we go gather all, uh, canned goods, um, and also took advantage of your programs to with a, with a homeless woman that I, that I actually put up in a hotel until uh, the Hour Center could find housing for her. So I totally appreciate and have voted for funding for the Hour Center for five years in a row. Thank you, I appreciate and, that support. And we all have. Yeah. We, this council has always supported the Hour Center and, and what they're doing. But I am really, really glad that the city is coming together, bringing all the resources to, to tackle this incredible challenge that we've got which is one of the reasons that I supported our inclusionary zoning ordinance so that we can start getting housing on lower end for, uh, for people who need housing. Sure. So um, thank you for all your work. And I would like to sit down with you and learn more about what you're doing. Sure, I would love to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, Council Member, uh, let's uh, go with Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that letter, too. I, um, I know how hard the staff of the Hour Center works and um, how hard you work and how hard uh, Joseph and the staff of Hope work. And we can't, uh, we need all the help we can get for human services. So I really appreciate that. Um, I've been over at the Hour Center stocking your pantry to <laughs> with uh, Excel. And um, of course, Edwina did a wonderful job for many, many years. So it's uh, very heartening to see the two of you, um, uh, you know, publicly expressing and explaining to the city at large what we do because you have very different missions, but we need both of you. And um, that, there's no doubt about that. And. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. But thank you. I would love to come over and talk with you too sometime. Sure, we'd love to have the discussion. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, thanks for both for the work and, and for your comments tonight. Um, could you just talk a bit more about why you signed up to be here tonight? Well, exactly the way I started the converse, or my, my presentation is, is both Joseph and I have heard on various venues and asked us directly, you know, despite what's happening over here that Julia discussed before I came up, um, a lot of people believe or are asking, is that affecting what we're doing boots on the ground in the community? And we both felt it was very important to come out and say, it's not affecting us. Yeah, we're just, still doing our work. I, I just wanted to make maybe reinforce sure i know there's a perception because i've heard it from some that somehow our our two largest kind of leading uh nonprofits serving a very specific uh segments of pop of the segments of the population are somehow at odds and uh you're here to to deliver the message that you're not yes but you're unequivocally working well we're working on together of the same uh segments of our vulnerable population mm -hmm. that you've been serving in the past just one other question. Do we, um, I don't, 
maybe this is a question for council, maybe you know. Are you still providing navigation services? So we are on a month to month while we're waiting for the DA's office to So that make contract some... has not been yep. awarded. Yeah, exactly, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Can you hand this down to Michelle, please? All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Christensen, are you still in the queue? Okay, that's right. Councilmember Martin. Um, thank you. I also appreciate the work that you do, and I'm very glad to hear um, because a number of constituents have expressed concerns to me um, that uh, about uh, Hope and the Hour Center being perceived publicly as being at odds. So I'm extremely glad to hear um, that uh, that's not the case. Um, I do have some questions about the coordinated entry process and about the procurement process. Are you able to uh, uh, answer the question that Ms. Russ Rush was not able to answer? Do you know whether the list of, of, of applicants uh, for that award was intended to be confidential according to the terms of the, of the agreement? No, I could not answer whether that was, <clears throat> whether that was to be made public or not. I'm not sure. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. How is that? Who prepares, who prepares um, those applications on behalf of your organization? So our development department works with our program team to basically receive an RFP that outlines what information that we should be providing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we put that packet together and send it in. Okay. So you as the executive director are not aware of the particular terms of the RFP? Um, of the RFP itself, yes. And then what happens and what's public after that? No. Okay. Um, and then did you, I, I, I know that you're going month to month mm -hmm. in, in terms of being funded to do the coordinated entry process. Um, uh, did you ultimately apply for the 2020 uh, um, process or not, for the 2020 award or not? Yes, we did. And is that a competitive application? That is, is it going to be you or Hope or maybe somebody else that we don't know about? Or what are the terms of that application? So, yeah, basically it is competitive. Whoever applies, whether it's two, five, a hundred um, mm -hmm. different vendors or community agencies, um, then it's for them to score and determine who is the best fit for that RFP. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, we did apply for that. All right, thank you very much. Yep, no problem. Um, thanks. I'm going to ask sure. you, if you don't remember the answers, I just, I just, I just, this is a great opportunity. It dawned on me. Sure. And, uh, and uh, might be a little uncomfortable, but uh, Julia Rush is your chairman, right? Yes, the board. correct. And so uh, I just, now that we're here, there's, I'm looking out at faces, and there's a lot of mistrust right now on council, right, it, as a result of, of the investigation, et cetera. But, uh, in an, uh, sure, Councilor Peck. Oh, okay, then it's, a re it's actually a review or inquiry. That's fine. The um, but uh, whatever's going on is a lot of mistrust. So I want to ask you, how many times have you and I spoken? Do you know how many times you and I can can you count? I mean, just generally speaking. Me and you. How many times have we had any substantive interaction mm -hmm. since your term here? I think two that I recall. One after uh, a. Um, a planning meeting, a public planning meeting. Um, <clears throat> I approached you afterwards to just ask about a, a comment that you made to get some more insight. And then um, we didn't get a chance to finish and you invited me to call you back and just finish my, you know, my questions for you. And we had a, a quick uh, conversation over the phone where you answered some more of my questions. And I believe that's been it. Okay. And so um, do you remember the phone call when you talked about the topic of the email um, and the, the, the concerns about the, the, the. So yeah, that's even that's. So I didn't even mention that with the first two because I forgot. Yes, that um, reached out and and asked about that as well. Um, okay. I vaguely remember that conversation. Was that before or after the election? It was after. Okay. Who called who? I, I reached out to you. Okay, and then in a nutshell, um, what'd you tell me? Just a summary. Well, basically, I, 
Just vaguely remembering, um, there was just concerns around uh, correspondence that we had and was not sure what was the, you know, what options we had, where, where do we, you know, what could we possibly do with any concerns that we might have so we knew what our, what decision or what options we had in front of us so then we could make a decision from there. Okay. And do, you, do you remember what, we, what, what the next step was going to be when we had that conversation? I do not recall that specifically off the top okay. of my head. Sorry. Uh, do, uh, does it sound about right that that we talked that Julie was going to give me a call? Well, that would be about right because I tried to also distance myself because again I wanted to focus on the R Center and this was a board concern. So yes, that would sound about correct. All right. And then um, whether the call occurred or not, do you remember the email that I got from Julia? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were copied on that, right? Yep. And and it went to my public address. I believe so. Yes. Okay. All right. So that, that's how I remember it. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Nobody else is in the queue. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, let's go on to Norma Figs. Did you get the S on the end of fig? It's just fig? F I G G S. Okay, figs. It's written on my letter. <laughs> yes, it is. We got Good your evening. <laughs> it's kind of hard to hear, but then I'm older than I used to be. Um, I've listened to the disruptive noise created by planes over Longmont for years, the last 11 of which has seen an increase directly over my home. It has been disturbing, to say the least. A primary source of this noise is from the otters that fly, oh, fly skydivers. I have read comments from folks who feel that these planes and skydivers should be able to do what they want. If these flights were a necessary part of survival, that might lend a different view of what's been allowed to occur over many years, ignoring the fact of Mile High's blatant avoidance of paying their way for the rules and regs of the airport. As it is, this for-profit for enterprise of Mile High Skydiving puts a negative spin on how this community chooses to operate. Do we allow the noise and confusion in spite of negative feedback from residents? Do we continue to turn a blind eye to what we see happening, the disregard by folks wanting to do what they want rather than what is beneficial and not discordant for the majority? I live in the south part of Longmont. For 43 years, I have enjoyed my neighborhood, my community. During this time that Mile High has been taking skydivers up, my family has been bombarded with noise by their planes. Having to run indoors when the planes fly is not conducive to enjoying the out of doors. Disturbance of outdoor activities has been the norm and unfairly so. We've seen the news where deaths have occurred when the divers do not end up in the drop zone. Mile High has blatantly ignored the city's rules that have been in place for a long time regarding payments to the city for use of city facilities at the airport. If citizens were to ignore city bills, how long could our community sustain itself? I want my elected officials to act responsibly and demand due diligence from everyone. This facet of a continuing problem will not go away on its own. It will take Council's dedicated perseverance in assessing the damage that has been done and will continue without your taking a leadership role in dealing with this problem and eliminating the negative impact of planes that fly overhead, make horrendous noise, and ignore these regulations. Boulder has its own problems with the noise planes make taking off and landing. We are all connected. There needs to be restrictions and regulations that must be followed by all planes and pilots, regardless of who is flying them or where. Longmont can lead in this effort and be a guiding light for other communities. All around us, we see increased air traffic 
and we most likely will see more. Colorado is a go-to state for those leaving other states for various and sundry reasons. They come here because of what we are, what we stand for, because residents care about our community and our state. If you do not become involved to a greater extent in creating harmony, peace, quiet, equitable behavior by everyone, then we will become a place no one wants to live. Some supporters of freedom to use the airways as they want think that residents don't have rights as well. Please do what you can to remedy this situation. Make it equitable for all. Don't disregard the input from citizens. Longmont will suffer if you do. Kimberly Gibbs has worked tirelessly for resolution to this issue for years. Thank you, Kim. I've been involved, spoken to previous council members about the issue, written letters to the paper. Many folks have put forth time and effort to find solutions, giving up time with their families to attend meetings, council meetings, trying to find a way to change this situation. Everyone involved with Quiet Skies has spent numerous hours trying to solve the dilemma. I still find lists in drawers listing the dates, times, and sounds of the otters flying loud and low. Letting the airport know has not done any good over all these years, and I don't expect that it will change unless you make the change happen. Please open your minds and your hearts to hear and understand what has happened and will continue to happen unless something is done to change it. I appreciate your time and the opportunity to speak about a very important issue. I speak for others who feel this way as well. And a little caveat at the end, the pollution that is created by the leaded fuel in these large otters should not be overlooked and must be a part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Ms. Figs? Ms. Figs? Yeah, yeah, come back, come back. All right, Council Member Martin. Hi. Hi, Ms. Figs. Nice to see you. You are welcome. I, um, I have already responded to your letter, actually, but... How um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? On my email? Yeah. Good. Thank yeah. you. I'm glad I put it down. Thankfully provided your email. You're most welcome. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was, I was just wondering, are, are you aware of the extent to which a municipality may regulate planes in flight uh, from its airport? I, you could better repeat the question. First of all, I'm hard okay. of hearing, but it's a little convoluted. Yeah, and I, I would, I'll try to my clarify. My first reaction was no, I don't know all the ins and outs, but if you would repeat that, I'll okay. work on it. I was asking if you know what a city may do about somewhat, noise. Somewhat, somewhat. I am not as, um, well, informed as Kim certainly is. No, I can't say okay. that. Well, is, is that leading someplace that maybe something I can't of, answer? I, yeah, I want everybody to know that once the plane's wheels leave the ground, the city has no authority to regulate the noise it makes. I don't know that for sure. That's uh, for do sure. Do you know that for sure? Yeah, I do. I... I was on the airport advisory. I'm surprised, but... No, it's true. Kim will probably confirm that. Um, but I do, I I do have a, a little bit of information, just maybe hearsay, um, that they could cut back on the sound by doing certain things to the airplanes. Yes, they could, but we don't have any authority to require them to do that. You, um, meaning council? Meaning the council. Or the city. The city, okay. the airport management, none of us have any But wouldn't that be a nice report. way to get along with people? It is would. And I, hope, make it I hope that you will, quieter. you will take your requests to mile high because uh, oh, I we have, have, over, we have you, taken I had to, that request you to mile high. You saw where I changed the eight years to 11 years. Mm -hmm. Kim, we were meeting earlier. Her son walked in. He was four years old when I first met Kim, got involved with this, and I wrote originally in my notes to, mm -hmm. uh, that it was eight years, and time flies. I yes. know probably more than everybody here because I'm older than everybody here. Yes. And not that that gives me any push up or foot up. 
I in, love the, in the knowledge feels. department, but okay. Any other older, questions? Older than any, everybody here. It's it's a great feeling, isn't it? Um, but uh, so far, <laughs> <laughs> the alternative is worse. Um, the uh, are you aware that the, that the city recently did a safety study um, and um, began enforcing uh, safety infractions that were found against? Um, why did mile it, high sky why did it take so long? I mean, were they just things that were occurring most recently that they had to be corrected? There were, yeah, there were there were new practices that had come into play over the years mm -hmm. uh, as the organization uh, essentially tried to squeeze more and more and more and more flights out of the time that they they had. You know, the good. You're saying time mile high. Had. Mile high okay. did that, yes, um, and as. Uh, a consequence of our attempts to uh, enforce those things, um, Mile High, is Mr. Slater here? He's not here. Um, if you don't, we don't need to necessarily get him, I, if you know the answer, Harold. What, what was Mile High's response um, to our attempts at enforcement? I just want everybody to, to know where we stand on this. But we're also currently in litigation, yeah, I and know so I yes. just as Mr. May, Mr. May, I'd like to invite you down too, so you can muzzle the city manager if you need to. I, in fact, only wanted him to tell me. You can tackle the, him too. That's okay. That'd be yeah, much better the, television. The name of the procedure that's going on. Um, currently, we are in a Part 16, um, which the way those issues are resolved with the FAA. Uh, they have two options they can go forward with, a Part 13, which is more of an informal procedure, and a Part 16, which is a formal procedure. Uh, we have engaged in that activity. Um, we are still in that process. The FAA has um, um, extended um, their decision point in that, and we hope that we will hear from it um, by the end of February. But this is completely in the purview within the Federal Aviation Administration. And that's exactly in all I wanted to know, because essentially, while that's going on, we're pursuing it, but we really can't discuss it. Whatever you guys could do to make a change would really help. My daughter has tinnitus. She cannot be outside when those planes are flying. Makes a mad dash for the door. Anybody else? Yep, hold on. Councilmember Peck. I just wanted to say, Norma, I understand your frustrations and share them. But I also just want to tell the public that we are, we are working on this issue. Unfortunately, it's all in executive session at the moment, which means that they're legal issues and we can't say anything about them. So my taking time to be here tonight means and getting that response, or everybody's a little bit more aware of the steps that, it, that are being taken, and that's a positive. So thanks. And, and we have made progress. We just can't tell you what it is at this point, <laughs> and, and it's very frustrating <laughs> because I do Thank want to Thank you for just that clarification. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Anybody Thank else? You. Nope. That's it. Thanks for your time. No, Appreciate what you do. All right. Thank you. Kimberly Gibbs, speaking of legend. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, members of council. I'm Kim Gibbs. I live at 7468 Mount Sherman Road, Longmont address located in Gun Barrel. Tonight I'm speaking about environmental quality and local control. But first, just very briefly, uh, a small correction. Piston engine aircraft use leaded aviation gasoline. The twin otters are turboprops. They use jet fuel, and it's not leaded. So <laughs> moving along, just wanted to make that quick. Um, Noted. Yeah. OK, so last week I attended a presentation on air quality hosted by Sustainable Resilient Longmont and the Longmont Sunrise Movement. Dr. Detlev Helmig presented his findings based on measurements of greenhouse gases and fine particulates collected from multiple Boulder County research sites. He explained that nearby oil and gas operations are significantly impacting air quality in Longmont and Boulder County. Air quality studies examine what's in the air. But how do we use that data to understand the health effects caused by these pollutants? Fortunately, those studies have already been done. In 1991, BYU professor C. Arden Pope 
published a landmark research paper titled Respiratory Hospital Admissions Associated with PM10 Pollution in Utah, Salt Lake, and Cache Valleys. Dr. Pope's study showed that fine particulate emissions from Geneva Steel were strongly correlated with increased respiratory hospital admissions. During that time, I lived in Utah Valley and was able to meet with Dr. Pope. And while he acknowledged the importance of his research as the basis for policy decisions, he credited activists for, the de for their dedicated efforts, which eventually led to stricter air quality standards. Those activists were students and Mormon women, mothers who were fighting to protect their children's health, oftentimes <clears throat> in defiance of the church's pro-industry stance. They knew that Geneva Steel was poisoning the air despite the industry's well-funded propaganda campaign. Dr. Pope's study and later research showed that fine particulate and ozone pollution harm public health, causing serious respiratory illness, including asthma and premature death. <clears throat> Once again, Longmont is taking a leadership role in support of environmental quality, and I commend your pledge to transition to a clean energy economy. Moving on to the airport. So today I'm speaking on behalf of many county and city dwellers who are routinely subjected to the abusive noise nuisance created by mile-high skydiving. How does skydiving, an activity that is widely recognized as the worst sport for the environment, align with the city's climate goals? How are leaded aviation fuel emissions being addressed? By now, we all understand that even though Longmont owns the airport, the FAA grants not federal law, prevent any local control over noise and emissions. What can you do? First, urge Congressman Ken Buck to co-sponsor the Aircraft Noise Reduction Act, which is currently under consideration in the U.S. House and would restore local control over noise at the Longmont Airport. This bill is sponsored by Congressman, amazing Congressman Joe Neguse, and was drafted in support of Quiet Skies. We know that Ken Buck does not value environmental quality. He won't do it, but at least you can make it clear that you do. Second, restore local control over your airport by foregoing the heavy government subsidies, primarily FAA grant monies, that explicitly prevent local control. Without the federal grants, how can you close that funding gap for capital improvements, because it's the only way right now. The, air ca the airport can become financially self-sufficient by adopting landing fees for airport users and installing a solar field on that undeveloped 40 acres of land at the airport. Other airports are doing this. And finally, you can support incentives for airport users to transition from the 1960s era piston engine leaded fuel fleet to cleaner electric planes that are being developed in Colorado at by Aerospace down in Littleton. For my part, 2020 is gonna be a great year. We have a lot to look forward to and I'm gonna to continue to support citizen groups who value environmental quality and who are working to improve the quality of life and their communities. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Appreciate it. All right. Tessa Hale. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's, I mean, have a seat for a second. Well, I see, I think, uh, I see a couple kids in the audience and following the, uh, I see uh, a kid in the back. Are you going to be, the, 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 the kiddos in the very back, are, are, are you guys here to say something or with someone? Okay, so why don't we have you and your son come up first? All right, come on up. And then uh, I see some kids here, Edstrom kids, right? So you'll go next. Any other kids in the audience to have school tomorrow? <laughs> Good try, James. Good try. That's all right. Out 
and that the, the newspaper is already you should be able to do this. the newspaper is already pointing to their ears. So when you when you get ready to talk, just make sure you're in that microphone. Oh, okay. He but he wasn't saying anything. He was saying everything very important, but nothing substantive pertaining to his comments, John. And since I have more time, I'll speak off topic just a little bit. And uh, um, I was in, uh, I lived in Virginia before we moved here, and I was in Richmond yesterday. And in spite of all the slanderous reports of white supremacists and um, white nationalists and hate groups, I found nothing but love. I found love of country, love of freedom and liberty, and love for one of another. Love for one of another, can't spit it out. Love for one of no, one another, uh, regardless of race or anything. That's all I found there. I found I ran into a Nazi hunter, and I told him, I don't know. Check up in Idaho. There might be three. I think there's three of them in three Nazis up in Idaho in a cabin. But all the slanderous news is just ridiculous. I found nothing but love there. So just wanted to let y'all know that. Um, oh yeah, and I'm gonna. Actually your, your name is James Nielsen. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. As you know, I've been speaking about the drinking water fluoridation, and last week when I was speaking afterwards, my son told me that somebody was in the back, kind of chuckling, and when, uh, and uh, we think he thinks that uh, the ha-has occurred when I stated that fluoride is not even good for your teeth. So I'll explain that. Fluoride is a killer poison. It's used as a pesticide in farming, a principal ingredient in rat poisoning. So, of course, this killer substance kills bacteria on the surface of your teeth when applied topically when you brush your teeth. Thus, is very useful in preventing cavities because it kills bacteria topically. So, so that's topically. Swallowing it. Um, does not really, uh, oh, s swallowing it supposedly has the same effect uh, by building up into your bones and making your enamel stronger, but brittle is not stronger. It makes your bones brittle. In 2002, Colorado Springs ended fluoridation, and at the time, the mayor, Mayor Lou Makepeace, who voted in favor of continuing the fluoridation, scolded the anti-fluoride pe fluoride people by breeding hysteria um, while passing out petitions. And they talked, she said, her, I quote, they talked about it in terms of poison and toxic waste, she said. The emotionalism got ahead of the data. So I have some data here tonight. We all know that it's a poison and it's a toxic waste. It, it's derived from toxic waste, literally. There's nothing emotional about that. It's fact and data. Here's a chart that's derived from data from the World Health Organization. It's a chart directly from, um, from showing data from 18 westernized countries over about a 35-year period from 1970 through 2005, roughly, showing a dramatic decrease in cavities, and show, which is an increase in oral health and teeth health, right? See the dramatic de decrease in cavities over from 1975-ish to 2003, 2005 or so. Dramatic decrease over a 30-year period of cavities and improved oral health over that period. Now, 14 or so of the countries were unfluoridated. Any, can anyone explain that? What contributed well, to the decline in cavities over the 35 year period in the countries that were not fluoridated? Any explanation? Thank you. Brushing with the poison, the killer poison, that kills bacteria and prevents cavities. So there you go. There's the data that, I don't know, apparently, Miss, uh, respectfully, Mayor Makepeace didn't know about. And about, that's about all I have. Questions? 
Uh, not for you, okay. but thanks. Yeah, all right, cool, thanks. All right. Sorry, buddy, you're gonna have to go to school tomorrow. All right, let's go on to Violet and Christian Edstrom. If your parents are speaking with you, come up, but I assume they're alone. Come on, kids. That, sure, that's all right. That's all right. The family needs to get out of here so the entire family can go and. All right. Hi, Mia Ragley and City Council. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much again for proclaiming last Tuesday uh, Healthy Drinks for Kids Day in Longmont. That's really exciting. Um, and I also kind of wanted to go into the background of how this all started uh, with the proposed ordinance of making the default beverages and children's menu the um, healthy choice. So um, I've always been interested in wellness, but after becoming a parent 10 years ago, I became really, really interested in kids' health. So I co-founded a a nonprofit called St. Frank Healthy Kids, and our goal is to elevate the health of kids uh, here in the St. Frank Valley School District through education. Um, for instance, we get grants from Boulder County Farmers Market, buy local produce, bring it in, have taste testings with kids in all different schools. Um, fun fact, kids in Longmont love beets, whether they're raw or roasted with goat cheese, so good on them. Um, so we've done a lot of work with kids, but we also wanted to include parents so we began having a series of potlucks for parents where they could get together and talk about concerns they had with children's health. Um, and this is kind of where we started with all of this, is the overwhelming, overarching response from parents was that um, they were really frustrated with trying to raise healthy kids in an environment that doesn't necessarily help with uh, supporting those decisions. Um, so, you know, as we all know, for instance, kids are bombarded with uh, advertisements from soda companies um, really makes educating kids on this an uphill battle. Um, parents also mentioned going to restaurants and having their kids see soda on the menu and having being in the difficult position of either um, getting into an argument and being the bad guy with their kids um, and having to say no or giving in to the pestering and uh, feeling bad and guilty about making that decision for their kids. Uh, the, the truth is that children's menus are just uh, for kids who are young enough, who are too young to be able to make really sound health decisions for themselves for the most part. Um, in order to teach them healthy decision making, it helps a lot to have healthy choices readily available for children so that they learn that um, having soda or sugary drink is fine as an occasional treat, but is not necessarily the best everyday beverage to consume, and especially not as a proxy to water. Um, this became especially troubling to me and, uh, as I learned the facts that I uh, mentioned to you last Tuesday regarding the disturbing trends in obesity and overweight in kids here in Boulder County and the ensuing um, illnesses that they face. So we knew we had to make a difference in some way. So over two years ago, we started doing outreach and education here in Longmont. We hosted many different get-togethers with the community. We're invited the entire community at the youth center and at the museum and the library and all different places, in addition to attending a lot of the Longmont festivals like Cinco de Mayo and Unity in the Community. And really the overwhelming response that we've gotten when we've uh, proposed the idea of just um, putting the language of healthy beverages on kids' menu, but still allowing parents absolutely the choice to choose whatever they want for their kids. Um, and I will say I've talked to hundreds of people, and maybe two or three have been against it. Um, it seems like something that's really um, favorable with the Longmont population. Um, I've lived in Longmont my whole life. I was born and raised here. I love Longmont more than anybody. I love this place. <laughs> Back when all my high school friends were embarrassed to be from here, and said that they were from East Boulder County. Um, <laughs> instead of saying, you know, before this was kind of a cool place with breweries. Um, I love this community, and one of the reasons is that it's always valued its residents, and it's done the right thing. And um, whether that's bringing next light to our homes, to fighting to make RTD keep its promise to bring the rail here to Longmont before I'm in a nursing home, um, to uh, helping our community uh, be free from the health effects of fracking as much as possible, 
we do the right thing, and I really feel like this is the right thing to do, especially as a heal community. And um, it's, it just shows that we care about the health of our kids. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We want to get to the kids. Yeah. Come on, Christian and Violet. Christian, don't be nervous. You're just on television. There's only 100,000 people watching. Um, my name is Christian. Actually, and you know what? Let's yeah. do this. Could you, uh, sorry, Christian, could we get him just, could they stand at the, the manager's podium? Yeah. Although it's not a podium, but yeah, Harold's chair. The seat of power, guys. Here, why don't you go stand over here so we can see you? No, 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 yep. Stand right up there and talk into that microphone. Put it right up. Great. Yep. My, my name is Christian. You're going to be, hold on. There, you're gonna, we're going to get you on TV. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. I think so. There you go. Okay. My name is Christian. And of, um, I think you know, uh, a lot of you, some of you know that I'm the son of Christina. I'm basically talking about the same thing. So please help us pass the ordinance because kids eat fruity gallons of sugary drinks each year and kids want to be healthy when they're grown-ups when kids see a menu they pick what's on the menu and if they see water or milk they will choose water or milk and not be picky all right cool violet do you want to stand there at the podium you're a little taller okay. and then could you get that microphone right up in front of your face um my name is violet estrom um Sugar is not healthy, so why feed it to us kids, even when it's not that good for you? Kids need to be healthier in our society, so we need you to help us provide a better diet for children. That's also why we need you to please help us try to make kids healthier. Awesome. You guys did great. Tim, do you have anything to say? <laughs> Peer pressure. I dare you to speak out against... A sugary drinks ordinance. <laughs> I dare you. That wouldn't look good at home for me. And good evening to you. Um, and I just want to speak out on behalf of the same potential ordinance that would make the default option on menus for kids something that's not a sugary beverage. And I'm going to get there by a slightly circuitous route, which is when people come to my home, I typically ask them to remove their shoes. And the reason I do that is because as a male for almost 40 years, what I realize is that when you go into a man's, men's bathroom and you go up to a urinal, there oftentimes is a puddle of urine right in front of it. What the women may not realize here is that some of the urinals that men have have a little B picture that's right above the drain. And for some reason, us men love to aim right at that B. And apparently, it prevents spillage by 80%. My point here is that there's this concept of behavioral economics, which means we can just give people a slight nudge to change their behavior in a direction we think is positive. And this doesn't necessarily mean we're telling people what they can or cannot do, but we're simply giving people a nudge. And these are just ideas that are endorsed by Richard Thaler, who's a University of Chicago economist, who's also a Nobel laureate. This is the same concept, for example, of employers who would have it as a default that you would put money into a retirement account with a specific with a specific rate already set. So the default is that which we encourage is positive behavior. And if you choose to get out of that, that is absolutely your choice. But in the same way that, that the nudge theory works is that we're asking this city council, we're urging them to, to really seek out putting the default on a menu, something that's not a sugary beverage, because this is simply the city of Longmont nudging certain behavior that we would think is a, as a positive good. Uh, essentially, this just makes it a lot easier for parents who are going out to restaurants to make a decision on behalf of their kids. That's something that's less healthy, or something that's a healthier choice, and preventing some of the issues that might occur, such as having the fights with kids over why they can't pick the soft drink that's listed already there. But again, just like the other, other examples here, those parents who choose to give their kids soft drinks can still make that choice, but at least the default option is an easier option for them. So simply we're asking the city council to allow parents, just give them the nudge that they need to allow the kids in Longmont to be healthier. Thank you. Wait, wait, wait. So you want bees on urinals? I want bees on urinals. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> no, just kidding. Dr. Waters. 
Thanks, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> this, I don't know if this would be better for you or the rest of your family. Um, uh, and I don't know their questions so much as um, just reflections. Uh, uh, we did ask for this to come back in an ordinance. I'm certain we'll see it soon. Uh, we've all received some correspondence since that motion. Uh, um, taking us to task, I don't know if it's all of us or me, for, for turning Longmont City Council or Longmont into a nanny state. You know, we're not Boulder, we're not New York City, this is Longmont, let us be and make those decisions. So just a couple of reflections. One is <clears throat> uh, what, what, what has been proposed, and what we'll see I'm certain, uh, doesn't take away options from parents if they want to order sugary drinks. It simply makes the first choice, the default on the menu, a healthy choice, correct? That is correct. Yeah. The enforcement of that isn't fall to code enforcement in Longmont. The county is going to assume responsibility for code enforcement. And that's my understanding, yeah. correct. And so uh, just one last reflection. Um, in an another chapter of, of my life, I was involved uh, with funding from NIH, National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control, Scripps Institute, uh, in anticipation what it, of what they saw uh, as the next huge economic and health crisis in this country, type 2 diabetes and childhood obesity. That was a decade ago. Today, the very kids we were concerned about then are 10 years old, and we're seeing the effects of those decisions that have been made over time. So um, the best time for us to have adopted, for Longmont to have adopted the ordinance we're talking about was 10 years ago. The next best time is next Tuesday night, right? So parents can decide what they want to order for their kids. Uh, but we're going to make a statement about what we think are, are healthy choices as first choices on menus. So thanks for your leadership on this. Appreciate you. Councilmember Christensen. Yeah, I think it's funny that you got stuck doing this. <laughs> One more question. I loved your comments. But um, so, do you have any good ideas on how to make the default putting the lid down? See, <laughs> <laughs> well, don't put a B on top of this. 50% of the population <laughs> would be so happy. You know, I will start a committee to discuss this event. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. All right. Tessa Hale. Sorry for the delay. Well worth it. Good evening. Mayor Bagley and City Council. I'm Tessa Hale. I'm with Boulder County Public Health. It's a tough act to follow Tim and the urinal cakes, um, but I'll try. I, I'm here also to talk about the proposed ordinance on healthy drinks for children's meals. And I just want to give some pers a perspective from the public health uh, perspective. So in reading some of the comments I saw on the Times Call Facebook page and in the TC line, I feel like maybe not everyone had a chance to fully read the article. So this is just some clarifying comments. So first and foremost, as Councilmember Waters just explained, this is not at all about taking anyone's choice away. This is really just about nudging people into making a healthier choice. The reason we're talking about sugary beverages is pretty straightforward. Sugary beverages have no nutritional value and lead to a whole host of negative health outcomes. Overweight and obesity leading to heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cavities. There's really just no good to come. And there's no problem with people choosing to drink that, right? That's great but it shouldn't be an everyday choice if you want to have a life where you're not on meds um, or having different kinds of medical interventions for the rest of your life, which is what we're looking at for our children's generation. Um, additionally, it was good to hear you know, some reference to the cost. Just the last time this data was collected was in 2009. Uh, Colorado spent over $1.6 billion treating diseases and conditions related to obesity. That was in 2009. And at that time, the prediction was made that a 5% reduction in the average BMI, or body mass index, for Colorado adults could save the state more than $10 billion by 2030. So I don't know how that breaks down to Longmont, but you can imagine that you know, it would be a big cost savings overall. 
So from a, a health perspective, from an economic perspective, this makes a lot of sense. We're not taking choice away. I also think it's important to look at the beverage industry spends $866 million every year marketing primarily to children and communities of color. And they have a goal of increasing people consuming these beverages because it makes them money. So as much as we get out there and we do education and we do outreach and we want the choice to be for parents and for kids and for individuals, we also know that if you go anywhere you go now, you're gonna see a sugary beverage, whether it's the restaurant, the hardware store, the craft store, they're everywhere, right? So if we're trying to teach our kids how to make healthy choices for the rest of their lives, teach them that with a meal, you know, have, have water or milk. And we know that this works. Disney decided to offer healthy default beverages. People stick with it 66% of the time. You don't even think about it. When you see a sugary drink, choosing something healthy, it becomes an upstream choice for families and for kids. Kids also, the average age of kid eating off a children's menu is five. They don't know at that point the difference of what, what they're doing. Um, and I'll just close with you know, all the major health organizations, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Heart Association, American Academy of Childhood, um, sorry, Pediatric Dentistry, American Academy of Dietetics, all came out and said kids five and under should not be drinking anything besides unflavored milk and water. And so really all we're doing is saying, let's just make it really easy for parents and kids to do what we know is right and best. And to Tim's point about nudging people in the right direction, if you have a recycling bin out, people are more apt to recycle. If you don't, people aren't going to. So I think what we're looking at doing is just creating an environment that makes it possible for our kids to live long, healthy lives. And Boulder County Public Health can support the implementation of this policy. Thank you. All right, Councilor Mayor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Beckley. I just want to make a, a statement to kind of head off some TC comments that the, um, the statement about code enforcement was not code enforcement on parents to make sure that they are uh, choosing a healthy drink for their child off the menu. It is for the restaurants to make sure that they are putting uh, that as the default drink for children because I can just in my head hear some of the things about, oh no, the police are gonna come after us to make sure that we ordered those healthy drinks. Right, thank you for clarifying. And, and, and just to be clear, the way that Boulder County Public Health would support this is, as you all probably know, we already conduct regular uh, inspections of restaurants. So this would just be, we already look at menus for food safety. This would just be adding it in. All right, good, so, great, thank you. Okay, We're gonna take a five minute break. I'm sorry, do we have a motion? No? Okay, we're gonna take a break.
All right, let's go ahead and get started again. So there's been a request. So tonight there are, just so you know, there are uh, four, uh, 31 requests to speak, and we have gone through 11. So we jumped over 10. So that number 10 will be number the 12th, but we're going to hear from Jody Potma, who's number 10. Then we're going to pick up with Maureen Shohan, or Siohan, who's 13. Then 14 is Roxanne Himmel. Oh, wait. And then we have uh, Robin Demper Stevens, who's 15. Then uh, Laura Hickey, who's 16. Then Gordon Pedro, who's 17. So that's where we're at. So uh, I assume you're Jody. I am. All right. That's. Actually, right no, here? Jim's came were these 11 and Jeff is, Moore's 12. Is this better? Is that, right. that okay? Yeah. All right. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council members. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Jody Potma, and I live on Eagle View Circle in Longmont. I've been a resident for 20 years. I am here this evening to show my support as well for the Healthy Beverage Ordinance. When I became a parent 13 years ago, I had no idea the challenges I would face in ensuring my children ate a healthy diet. At the time, I worked as a project manager and a developer at IBM. I believed in eating local and cleanly as possible. After the birth of my second child two years later and his emergency surgery at five days old, his surgeon stressed that he needed to stay away from a standard American diet. It was then I took... Uh, it was then I took what I fed my children seriously. So seriously, I went back to school and became a holistic nutritionist. I made this life change not only for my family, but for my community. As our children got older, I loved taking them to local restaurants. Eating out is always a treat, but often became a battle. Even before food was ordered, a server would come to our table and say something like, and for kids, here's the menu, Coke products, chocolate milk, and lemonade. As my children started to learn to read, that was the first thing they spied on menus and would say, can I have a root beer? Even though I knew better, I felt terribly guilty to say no. Typically, it was 6 p.m. and root beer can have upwards of 45 grams of sugar. So I brought a little sample, which is actually 11.25 teaspoons of sugar and one root beer, one 12 ounce root beer. I didn't want my children's belly full of sugar less than two hours before bed. This conversation always made everyone grumpy. It was a terrible way to begin what should have been a fun dinner. By the way, we still have these arguments and my kids are much older. Today, I am a culinary trainer for the national program Cooking Matters. I teach at the R Center. One of our lessons in the six-week program is on sugar. I am also the nutritional educator for EFA in Boulder, which this is not a sugar tax we're talking about, but the sugar tax in Boulder pays for that salary for me. Every time we discuss sugar in any of these um, situations, it is shocking to parents how sugar is a health hazard. When we discuss how sugar impacts children and, uh, and all of the statistics which you've already heard in detail, parents finally get it. Then they share stories of walking into Save-A-Lot or Walmart or King Supers or Safeway and how they're bombarded with the soda displays slash art they begin sharing what they see online and on TV commercials and how it doesn't seem fair that these conglomerates market to children. I am very optimistic about this ordinance because it is not a boulder tax, like many people misunderstand. This puts the choice when going out to eat squarely on parents, those who cho should oversee what their children drink anyway. If we're celebrating and my son wants a Shirley Temple, that is my choice. I am his mom. I would really like this, I would really like, sorry, I really like how this ordinance puts the decisions parent, on parents' hand because 60% of the time, parents choose the default choice. If McDonald's and Disney can do this without losing revenue, restaurants in Longmont will see the same. Children need, to, need our help to support a healthy lifestyle. They are consistently bombarded with sugar in so many forms. Not putting sugary beverages on children's menu is a great way to support families and to make Longmont a healthy city. Thank you. Thank Anybody you. want my sugar? <laughs> All right, James Kenworthy.
James Kenworthy, 107 Curve Replace. If Figsy is the oldest person in the room, I'm uh, up there in the top five. I'm a little hard of hearing too. And I missed the connection between men's urinal habits and the sugar, the sugary drinks. I s somehow I missed that. You don't have to explain it. Um, there are 31 people here giving comments. And I was wondering this afternoon how many hours it takes for one person to work their comments up. And it's probably two, two and a half to three hours. So we're talking about 90 hours of effort here. Plus, we sit here listening to other people. So that's another two or three hours per person. So this is a real, um, what I want to say, respectful process. There's a lot going on here. And I just want to congratulate the council on doing this. So it's a, it's a good thing to do. I'm going to weigh in on some of the things I heard. The sugar deal, that's part of the corporate system. The corporate system are attacking our children. And they're attacking their health. They're attacking our health. And we're facing mass extinction because of the corporate system. That's how we got here. And that's no joke. Uh, the climate uh, event last Thursday, we had 99 people there. The people, the people I know dreamed up the event. We, arra we arranged the uh, publicity. We went to the room in the afternoon and uh, checked it out. I think there was something else I was going to talk about. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Oh, the little thing I missed is mass extinction. We're facing mass extinction because of the corporate system. And we haven't talked about that for a while. I talked about carbon sequestration a few weeks ago. I'm going to talk about it again. We need to plant native trees, native shrubs, native flowers. Nature. If, if we ignore nature, we will not make any progress on this, uh, on uh, combating mass extinction. Okay. Thanks for holding this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jeff Moore, number 12. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of council. I'm here tonight to correct the record. Last Tuesday night, a member of this council stated that we'd had a conversation about the warrantless searches at the suites. That statement accused me of having prior knowledge of the searches and of not reporting the problem. This false statement is an assault on my integrity. I value my reputation. I value honesty and integrity above all else. This statement is nothing but slander. I am owed a public retraction and a public apology from the council member making this false statement. So if you want to do that, Joan, go ahead. I, yes, Cal I council apologize. Member Peck. I'm sorry, council member Peck. Thank you. I apologize for making that statement, but I didn't say assault on the suites. You can look at that. That was not in my statement, but I do apologize for making uh, the statement. Well, it wasn't. It's what other problem was there with the Longmont Housing Authority but the warrantless searches at the suites? There were problems with the board, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and with Michael Reese, just internal problems. It didn't have anything to do with the suites. Well, you can say what you will, but I we interpret it thank you for apologizing. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, all right. Is it Maureen? I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. You're going to have to help me out. Shohan? Is that how? Uh, 
good enough. What do you say? How do you say <laughs> it? Um, I say si wan. Si wan. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> good luck. Fail for me. All right. Cool. Um, good evening. So my name is Marine, <laughs> and I am here tonight to support affordable housing as a member of the Boulder County Regional Housing Partnership and the Home Wanted team. Um, as you may know, in 2017, nine jurisdictions came together to form the partnership and work together to address the county's housing challenges. They have collectively committed to triple the number of affordable housing homes by 2035. This means building 12,000 new units and preserving the existing 6,000 units throughout the county through committed police policies, dedicated funding, and created creative partnerships. We were very impressed to see several Longmont Council members at the East County Housing Coalition um, meeting last week. And on behalf of the partnership, we wanted to recognize the great work um, the city of Longmont has done to support and promote affordable housing in this community. We, of we often hold Longmont up as an example with our partner jurisdictions. Tonight, I wanted to express our commitment to continue to be a partner with Longmont and everyone who lives or desires to live here. We are here to support you and to help facilitate regional funding and policy solutions for the Longmont community and beyond. We are, look looking, we are looking for community members, leaders, elected officials, business owners, and anyone who cares about housing to join our home team. By joining the home team, you will be part of the solution to take sustained and courageous action in your community. We need your passions, skills, and energy to help build the equitable, resilient, and thriving community we know we can be, with access to affordable housing for all at our core. Um, now I'd like to show you a three-minute video um, with some of the stories we have heard in the community about affordable housing needs and solutions. I look forward to answering any questions and working with all of you in the coming year. And I do have signs. Um, I know some of you have seen, I have seen them right. before. Uh, Council, uh, she's going to be about 15 or 20 seconds over. Do we have any objection to that? OK, perfect. Let's go ahead. Don't want to play favorites for the homeless. $5,000 in my pocket, I was not able to get a six-month sublease so I can get my son back in my life. I lived on the streets for a long time. It was years before I got stable. What I felt really different about this workshop that I was in was that it centered voices and stories, narratives that we don't typically hear around the affordable housing crisis. Oftentimes, it's centered on just price and people are being squeezed out. There's all these other stories that make certain folks have an even harder time. We need to elevate those stories. I am a single parent. I am a part time student. I have two children that they have disabilities. I'm a hair stylist and I own a hair salon now and I did that because I know how to teach myself and I know how to survive. Currently I work as a mental health professional. I use my lived experience with alcohol and mental illness to become certified and help other people in a clinical setting. I was a 25 year hospice worker. I am involved in helping those that do not have voices to be heard. I run an organization here called Boulder Free Rescue. We do healthy food redistribution. I was able to work in a 30 year K-12 position as a teacher and administrator. Learning to share stories and personalized issues 
advocate for the right people in the right roles. What kind of society are we if we don't care for each other? By putting myself out there, I am putting a more positive face on the struggle. By gentrifying our communities, the economy cannot be sustained because we are essential. Cool. Dr. Waters? <laughs> Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, so I was one of, the, one of those who attended the meeting the other evening, and it was, it was good to see people come together um, in solidarity around this the need uh, to reduce housing insecurity and house those without homes. But I do have, I, I want to raise some questions tonight. Um, I don't know whether I'll stay with that effort because um, I wouldn't want to be a drag on it. But I, but there's some questions I think that I'd like as a council member, whether I'm in that involved in that experience or not. <clears throat> um, but I want to start with letting people know that today uh, we moved the first new residents into the Fall River Apartments, 50 permanently affordable housing units constructed by LHDC, managed by LHA, and supported by the city of Longmont. So we have, a, we have new residents moving in today. And just for whatever it's worth, residents from one of our other LHA properties formed a welcoming committee. And they were, were there to greet them as they walked through the door. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think it, maybe it was Verizon, but I'll get it wrong. Uh, uh, offered uh, gift bags, so new residents showing up in this property. It was a, it was a cool example of of folks in subsidized housing reaching out to welcome folks into a larger community. Uh, we also, at the LHA board meeting today, the LHA board passed a resolution that's gonna come to this council um, uh, as part of a partnership uh, to advance conversations we've had around the suites, which will be substantially uh, more additional permanently affordable homes for families around the suites. So, we're making progress on those fronts. Here's what, here's what I was puzzled by as we left the other evening. I heard the data, or the, the, the data point, that right now there are 54,000 residents in the, in the county of Boulder who are paying more than 50% of their income for housing. And anybody who understands the economics of household income and, and surprises knows just how housing insecure anybody would be. I, I didn't get it, I raised my hand, I didn't get a chance to ask the question, what number or percentage of that 54,000 would be people who would not qualify for subsidized housing? Teachers, first responders, hospitality industry, you know, you could line them up. I, I'm just speculating, I'm guessing a, a significant, and I, you don't have to, I'm not expecting an answer to this. But I'm, I'm guessing that a, a substantial number of the 54,000 would be working class families who are as stressed as it, making somewhere between 80 to 100 and, uh, or 110 percent area median income. Because we know living wages are so relative to the cost of housing and child care, right? So what, that number is just kind of an artificial one if we don't have attainable housing and, and affordable health care for those families. But the other night, what I heard was that segment of the population would not be a part of the focus for this effort. It would only be focused on folks below 60% 60, 60 AMI and below. Um, and I just want to say, I think that's short-sighted, and I'm not being critical of you. I'm saying to, the, to the, that effort, uh, the better we do with folks from from 80 to 100% of AMI, the more units that might end up for folks at 60% and below. This seems to me we should, be, we should be framing all of this as both and, not either or, right? Um, one last observation, and I would like your reflection on this, because this is the other question I would have asked, but time ran out. Um, I've spoken in sitting in, in this chair on more than one occasion. I've said it in other places. 
Uh, I think we're headed toward an interesting moment in Longmont, and not just Longmont, I think every county along the Front Range, uh, where we're going to have to come to grips with our frustrations with growth and quality of life for those who have it, and housing and quality of life for those who don't, right? Um, I keep hearing and reading about concerns in, in our local media about out-of-control growth. Longmont City Council stopped the growth. I had a conversation with a friend not long ago about the 1% the ballot measure that's being circulated, that's being the petition that's being circulated to replicate in 12 counties in Colorado what Lakewood has done to limit growth to 1%. All the data I've seen, if that were to be successful, all the data on the effects on housing are devastating. If we, if we want to rapidly increase housing insecurity and create a, a larger homeless population, that would be a surefire way to do it. But that happened in Longmont, or Longmont, that happened in Lakewood, and this ballot measure is being circulated because folks with quality of life who, who are not housing insecure would like to see us slow down the growth. And I understand it has to be smart. We have to be strategic about where we grow. We can't sprawl. Densities, and we're going to have to do more density, all the things we know from urban, urban uh, the new kind of new urbanism. But it seems to me that, that w the way this conversation got framed up the other night sounded to me like either or rather than both and. And um, I don't know how we, uh, how, we, how we stand in solidarity on housing if this becomes exclusive. So if you want to comment on any of that, I, I, maybe I'll weigh back in or I'll yeah. just listen. Yeah, I can try. Um, I, our goal is to be inclusive, um, first of all. And I do believe that we are using the 18,000 unit goal in 2035 as a data point because it's something that we can measure. Um, <coughs> it is not exclusive of finding solutions um, for middle income housing. Um, so that's to answer, I, I think, your first um, comment. Um, the second comment on growth um, is, is, is a difficult question to answer. Um, I, would say, I would say that we are um, trying to invite everybody at the table to find creative solutions so that we don't oppose growth, um, open space, affordable housing, and so on. Um, and so we're really opening up to the community um, through this year and beyond um, to try and figure out ways that we can all live together um, and that people who work in Boulder, in Longmont, in Boulder County in general, um, are able to live here um, because it goes beyond um, just uh, quality of life. It is also um, the health of those people, the health of the community that, that, that is at stake, um, the health of the children. Um, there are many data points to sh showing that um, um, housing um, stability um, creates um, better health for people, better education yeah, for well, kids. All their life circumstances um, are improved, yeah. yeah. When there's so. stable housing. As, as it moves forward, I'd like to be, a, I want to be a champion of, yeah. you know, the, of the cause. <laughs> um, but we need to keep drawing circles rather than lines, right? We're all in this totally. together. Yeah. And it's not at the expense of the quality of life, but no. we've, got to be, we've got to be able to have it, I think, the and. Yes, we can do this and maintain quality of life or protect quality totally. of life and our, yeah. our natural wonders. I'm just, I get nervous the more I read and hear that mm -hmm. we're headed towards an interesting flashpoint or h increasing tension in this community um, if, we, if we aren't willing to you know, cl cl clear it up. And maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to listen where I've got it wrong. But, um, but it does make me nervous with some of what I heard the other night. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your comments. I would um, please invite you to keep joining those meetings and um, voice your concerns because we need to hear, um, to hear all of them. Um, and we need to find solutions. Marie, you're, you're not excused yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Martin. 
Thank you, Mayor Bagley. And I apologize for my phone, which forgot to silence itself. It's supposed to know that that happens every Tuesday evening at 7, and somehow it forgot. Um, I agree with what Dr. Waters said, um, and but I also have another take on it. Of course, please, everyone should decline to sign any growth limitation ordinances because you are destroying the hopes of people who are housing challenged, who are homeless but seeking to be homed, especially the unemployed homeless, uh, or rather the employed homeless who are, you know, trying trying to get back on a footing of normalcy uh, and failing because there's no place for them to go. It just so happens that I'm closely engaged with four constituent families that are in that position, um, three who have approached me for help um, just as their council member, and one single parent with a child who is living with me and can't find a place to go. She doesn't want to raise her daughter in an upstairs bedroom with a loft and a shower, but that's the best she can find in Longmont right now because she can't pay the rent. And she works full time and she makes $14.50 an hour and I'm not even sure where that stands with regard to the AMI for a family of two. She's right on the cusp of maybe she qualifies for subsidies and maybe she doesn't. But I have been helping her look and the lines that she can get into are years long. There's, you know, Longmont's doing really well in terms of producing affordable and attainable units with our current um, affordable inclusionary housing ordinance, as as you pointed out, you know, we're kind of leading the pack in terms of getting those things built, but 15 years is not going to handle it because there are people today that are in a state of emergency and have no place to go. And I, I would like to produce, you know, propose that we declare a housing emergency the way we have declared uh, a climate emergency, uh, you know, what can we do? Karen, I, I have been talking to other constituents who aren't housing challenged about this too, and one of them surprisingly <laughs> asked a question that I had not thought to ask, and maybe you can answer it off the top of your head, and if not, I'm going to keep a promise to ask you right here and now, which is how many livable units in Longmont are owned by absentees or who are, um, you know, in some other way owned, owned by, by people who aren't living in them. And can we have a housing drive where even temporarily, transitionally, we can scare up all of those places to live and somehow put people in them to give them a decent life? Um, you know, there must be something that we can do, that we can, that, that we can um, find ways to house people in, in, in three months, six months, a year, because the impact on, on the lives of families with children especially is just too devastating to even think in terms of we've got a 15-year plan for it. That child has grown up and didn't go to college because it's a 15-year plan. Mayor and uh, city council members, well, the answer is I cannot answer that question. Um, but, but certainly we can, you know, we can look into what information we might have available mm -hmm. in that regard, but that is not something that we have, um, we have a ready answer for. And I would say that um, while I, I'm at the mic, so I do, I do just want to clarify for Council Member Waters that the ECHO Coalition meeting that many of us attended last week, mm -hmm. um, so, so that is different from the Home Wanted campaign. And so, um, so when they indicated that their focus was really on 
um, folks who uh, needed subsidized housing, so folks at the, the lower end of the AMI. Um, that, that certainly is something that is there is their focus that is not the focus the focus of the home wanted campaign for Boulder County is a is a broad range of um, affordable and attainable housing and certainly I think our interest um, with the home wanted campaign is how do we engage um, you know members of the the community so certainly the voices from that um, echo coalition we would want them to figure out you know to be voices for Housing, the need for housing, what are solutions, how to address some of the things that Council Member Martin talked about. But, um, but certainly the home wanted campaign is a, is a broader range of, of um, affordable and attainable housing. So I just wanted to clarify that. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Peck. Go ahead, do it again. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mayor Backley. Um, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Councilman Tim Waters said. Um, about the cap on growth. At the Dr. Cog meeting last week, we always have updates from the lobbyists as far as what bills are going to be presented, et cetera. And the conversation did turn to uh, capping growth because there are many municipalities along the Front Range that are interested in it. But, but I don't think it's just going to be petitions. I think there are elected officials in the legislature, and, uh, legislature that are looking at that issue. Um, so Dr. Cox is just going to monitor it at this point. Nothing's been presented. No bills have been written. But it is a, a Colorado conversation, not just Longmont. Dr. Waters? Thanks. That's, I mean, that we, that's, we need to be paying real close attention to what happens with this. So uh, Karen, the, the, so the meeting that you referred to, the meeting that Maureen referred to, is something different than the meeting I attended, apparently. Is the help because the home wanted sign several of us several council members were in the meeting that I was referring to the home wanted sign was shared in that meeting so these are two different meetings sharing a a signs in common or uh, mayor and council so yes yeah, so the um, this the echo coalition is it's a, it's a separate group and they invited um, you know, Mackenzie uh, Selke, who is one of the um, mem staff members for, on the Home Wanted Campaign, to really talk about what is the Home Wanted Campaign, just as they also invited um, someone from the Hawk uh, Broomfield Housing Opportunities Coalition, I believe is what that acronym stands for, just to inform the group about what activities are um, happening right now in Boulder and Broomfield County, but um, it, is a, it is a separate campaign. And I think our, our interest, we haven't had a meeting of the Home Wanting Campaign since that meeting, but I think we are really looking for where there are opportunities for intersection, for collaboration, because when you looked at many things that they had listed on the, on the, on the whiteboard in terms of data collection and a variety of other things, we already have that data for, uh, for for Boulder County. So we're really looking for the opportunity to, to, to collaborate um, and, and really to work together toward um, some common interest around affordable and attainable housing. Thank you. Maureen, if I put you on the spot, I apologize. I wasn't okay. trying to put you on the spot. Can I pass some signs so you can oh, I'd read love some, a little bit? <laughs> I'd love some signs. Uh, the, the the number the, the some of the big data uh, the big data points that were thrown out in this other meeting uh, are are very important. Uh, it's just that we, that meeting kind of turned exclusive, and it, I didn't quite understand why. Um, and if and if Echo is not, then right on. So thanks. All right, number fourteen, Roxanne Hummel, or Himmel, probably Himmel. And then Laura Hickey is next at 16. Rob, uh, Robin, it seems like, has crossed her name off the list. That's not true. Robin, throw something. My name is Rox Roxanne Himmel. I live on Elliott Street in Longmont. And I am here on behalf of the 2020 Census. Um, I'm here because I am a recruiting associate. And I have been working in Longmont with the library, our center, uh, the workforce, Boulder workforce. And we diligently need those to help us census count. We don't have enough census takers. And um, I'm sure you all know how important it is in this little flyer that I think Carmen was the one who actually put this one together. It's great because it really 
points out how important it is for us to get the funding. And if we don't, we can't support places like the library, our center, and many other facilities. Um, so I am here just asking for everybody to put the word out. We have some posters, which we were, we're trying to find places where there's a lot of um, traffic and be able to have people um, apply. It's $20.50 an hour they're now giving for census takers plus mileage. So we're, we're also going to be at Front Range Community College next week trying to hire uh, students who may need extra income. So I, br I did put together some little flyers and um, booklets so that maybe ad you could take a look at it and see if somebody needs extra income or they can help our community. We've had a lot of negative responses. A lot of people do not want to knock on people's doors asking them to complete their questionnaire or as we call it an invitation. All right, thank you. Thank you. Can I give you guys each one of these? You can. Thank you. All right, number 16, Laura Hickey. All right. 17, Gordon Pedro. Gordon Pedro, 2639 Falcon Drive in Longmont. And first off, I'd like to uh, congratulate everybody that was involved in the celebrating of Dr. Martin Luther King Day yesterday at uh, uh, Silver Creek High School. It was a great event and uh, one that made this resident proud of our city. Second item I'd like to talk about is Plan B. Last November, a majority of the previous city council members encouraged Longmont voters to approve ballot issue 3B, which would have authorized $45.5 million in bonds to construct a competitive swim facility and an ice rink. The ballot issue also involved a sales tax increase to pay for the bonds and to support the operations and maintenance of the pool and the ice rink. Approximately 63% of the voters said no to this proposal. I do not believe the defeat of ballot issue 3B means that residents will not support bonds and a tax increase to construct additional recreation facilities in Longmont. I believe voters rejected the facilities the city council placed on the ballot because they did not meet the needs of most residents. Immediately after the election, the Times Call interviewed several of you regarding Plan B for meeting the needs of the community for additional recreational opportunities. Most of the proponents of 3B had no Plan B. One comment was very direct. If the public wants a redo of this, they're going to have to tell us. I'm here on your night devoted to listening to say that it's time that you work with residents to develop a plan B. I'm one of the residents who actively opposed ballot issue 3B because it did not meet the community's recreational needs. I did and do believe we need an additional full service recreation center similar to the one at Quail Campus with expanded swim lanes. I'm asking you to demonstrate leadership in this matter and move past your disappointment in last year's election. I believe the key to success involves extensive community involvement to ascertain the recreational needs of the many residents who will have to vote yes for this to succeed. If residents are actively involved early in the process, we will understand and support the project before it becomes a ballot issue. Finally, I think the location where the facility will be built should be designated as part of the planning process and before the next ballot. If the new facility must replace Centennial Pool for the long run, explain why and trust that as voters, we are able to understand complex issues. I hope the next time additional recreational facilities are on the ballot, I can be an enthusiastic supporter. I know I will be if an approach similar to the one I just outlined is used. And I have a couple comments on things I've heard tonight. I would like to encourage the council to take the same approach as I outlined on several of the important issues that we are facing as a community. And that means involve the citizens intensely. Affordable housing, homelessness, homelessness, and rapid growth. I believe listening to residents 
in Lakewood that they went for the limit on housing development because they did not think the city council was listening. And I believe that when you don't listen and you don't involve your residents, you get reactions that are not good for anybody. Thank you. All right, hold on. Councilman Martin. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pedro. I uh, took very careful account of, of my constituents and um, what would have made them vote for 3B. And it seems like they were about equally divided among residents who would only vote for a facility if it was to be located in the southwest corner of the city and residents who were only going to vote for the facility if um, it was going to be located in the northeast corner of the city. Um, so tell me, which do you think is the best idea for those residents, for, for the council to, to place that facility in? I'm saying I think the best thing is to tell the citizens honestly what is at stake and let them make the wise decision because by leaving it up in the air, no one knows what your plans are and if you have hidden plans or whatever. So I'm saying be straight with your residents, get them involved early, and let us be a part of the solution as opposed to being told our community deserves this so you should vote for it. That is not a way of involving your citizens. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Gordon, you and I have been in this conversation in all kinds of different settings in terms of listening. So um, it will help me with what I should be hearing, not from, not from you, but maybe from you, but from the larger, from the community. Because sometimes, here's, here's my frustration. Sometimes it feels like, it feels like I'm listening, you know, regardless of what it looks like, you know, or, I, you know, and I understand I, I should listen more than I talk. Uh, but um, sometimes what I, the, the message I hear is do something about reducing housing insecurity and do something about homelessness and, you know, and, and responding to our most vulnerable residents. Uh, and then, and it, then it sounds to me like sometimes it's the same people, right? It's the same uh, collection of, of community members who are saying, but, not and, but slow down growth, uh, protect our quality of life, even if it means you can't address, that, this is, I'm adding these words, that you can't address the quality of life of this group over here, because you're going to have to build things in order to house them. I mean, it's the dissonance that's really frustrating to me. How, just, just talk to me what, about what, how should we be listening differently, and what messages should we be hearing, not on 3B. I, I'm, I'm down with, I, w I wish we'd have done an after action review in December and, you know, been actively involved in a conversation right now about what the new, you know, plan B is. I'm, I'm with you. But I'm, I'm on the second part of your comments about, you know, how do we, I thought um, in, the, in the affordable housing mix, in, uh, I thought we listened then. I thought we, I, you know, we have these kinds of sessions. Um, what, 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 what should we be hearing and who should we be hearing it from on the, on the issue of homelessness, housing insecurity, and, and the tensions with growth? I don't have the magic solution, but I do know that when we have all these tensions and we have division and we're not making any progress, not significant progress on finding the solution that's serving all of us, then it means we need to be more in dialogue because if we're not in dialogue, we're not listening to each other at all. And sometimes, to be honest with you, uh, I, citizens come down and they make their three minutes of tonight, it's five minutes, and then we have this interaction, which I think is great. Uh, and then they don't feel like they've really been listened to. They feel like they leave here uh, being lectured, and therefore they say, well, okay, they don't want to hear from us. So I'm just encouraging you to engage the full-fledged involvement, the citizen involvement process that the city has had for years, and really reach out there and listen and engage the citizens and let us be part of bringing things forward. I mean, 3B would have been a different story if there had been a lot more dialogue with the residents who were not necessarily involved in it or thought that that was the right approach. 
if we'd have been listened to earlier. I mean, I uh, maybe it wouldn't have, but I think that uh, I think I heard a lot of people say we need a full service recreation center. We didn't need what was being proposed. So in the housing, affordable housing, and homelessness, and this issue of whether or not a moratorium or a limit on growth is going to be imposed. If anyone would have told me Lakewood was going to do that, I'd have said, not a chance. Well, Lakewood did do it. And then I talked to several residents down there, and they said, the council's not listening. So what, so uh, just if, what are the messages that we should be hearing about growth and quality of life and homelessness, that combination of issues? Is there, is there a single message or, uh, you know, if you think about uh, uh, amping up signal to noise, right, and think about frequency, well, there's a lot of noise. What's the signal we should be hearing? Well, I think that uh, as much as it uh, doesn't reflect what most of us would like to believe is, uh, is good citizen input because there's no name attached to it, when people say, in the times uh, in the TC line, this and that about growth and congestion and all the stuff that's going on, it's not just coming out of their ears or their mouths for no reason. They have a concern. So let's figure out what those concerns are. All right, thanks. Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Pedro. Um, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I. I do think we, we did a fairly expensive um, survey. I think it cost $80,000, and many people responded more positively than anything else to a uh, rec center, that had a full-service rec center that also had various other community aspects like a library annex and child care, and yet we sort of eliminated that. So, I mean, I do think that, you know, we listen a little, but then not really. <laughs> so I, I, do, I do appreciate what you're saying. I think um, all of us could listen a lot more deeply. Uh, nobody's in the queue. I guess the, uh, first of all, I appreciate you coming tonight and raising this topic. The, uh, the uh, I guess p part of my, part of my uh, confusion, right? Is that so? We've got 100,000 people in this town. 31% of the vote is Republican. 38% are Democrat. 31% are unaffiliated. Right. So I mean, I'm not saying that because we're supposed to be nonpartisan, etc. But it just goes to show that Longmont is a, you know, I mean, we have all kinds of different views, right? And so a lot of times I'm stuck asking myself, well, who do you listen to, right? I mean, because we did do a survey. The only reason I got behind the ice rink was because the survey indicated that it would be more likely to pass if we included the ice rink. The um, and so uh, and uh, and uh, on one, I, I we my, my my opinion has not changed. We still need. I agree with you. A full service rec center and expanded swim lanes. Right. I mean, I mean that, that this, the need still exists. Regardless, in my opinion one of 100,000. And if Centennial Pool is going to go haywire in the next it, 10 years, it, it, it we need it more than yeah. ever. And so, and so, and again, there, uh, I mean, I think there's a lack of, I mean, I mentioned earlier a lack of trust on council at the moment, but also there's obviously a lack between the council and some members of the community, right? And so, uh, but as far as 3B goes, the reason why the location wasn't on there is because literally I don't think this council could agree at any time where it should go. Right, like my opinion, you know, you know, which I was pretty vocal with, is I would have put it right where Centennial is now, you know, partnered with the YMCA and put it right in the middle, right? Now I don't know if that would have passed if we would have told people, but that's what I want. But I've never heard from anybody else on council that that's what they wanted, you know. And so, uh, and the other thing is that the um, the other reality is, even though there's a hundred thousand and it's a third, a third, a third, not all citizens' voices are equal. Some are louder than others. Right, and so you got to be careful who you listen to, um, and and uh, if we're gonna do it again, right? You know, this job pays a thousand bucks for each of my colleagues a month, a thousand bucks. You know, fifteen hundred for mayor. Um, I got a full time job. You know, I have kids. I've got. I mean, I've got. I mean, if we're gonna do it again, 
right, then those people who are most vocal in the community, and when I say vocal, I mean they right i mean they, they they you know who i mean the people who are vocal right you're looking well, right at me i know yeah yes because i write letters when yeah, yeah, i yeah. have a yeah, strong so, opinion so, yeah, yeah 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 and that's okay right but but i personally am exhausted you know just like i'm exhausted you know of the i hate politics the irony is that i, I just hate it you know and so if we're going to do it again just tell me what you want you know, and let's let's make sure we get the swim pool and the facility, and because I don't, I wasn't expecting a campaign against it or a war or this or that. I'm just, and I think I speak for most of us up here. We're just trying to do what's best for for the city. And so, so I I have a good solution. I think yeah. I think the council should direct a very competent staff mm -hmm. that knows about facilities and knows about citizen participation and engagement, and tell them to do a full job of involving the people in figuring out what we need to put on the ballot the next time. And the council, all you have to do is slam dunk it because you'll already have those of us who didn't like the last proposal, you already have us with you. Okay, that's a good, that's a great idea. It is. So, Councilman Martin. Thank you, Mayor Begley. I'm not sure I do think it's a good idea. Um, See what I mean? Go <laughs> <laughs> see what you mean. Yeah, I'd like to see a citizen petition because, you know, we did listen to a lot of people coming to the public, invited to be heard, and we did do, I think, a pretty thorough job of, of polling the public. And then from where I sit, Mr. Pedro, I think that some, and you're not the only one, but some organizations who opposed the pool and ice rink who had been pretty quiet beforehand, uh, came out with messaging that wasn't really quite accurate. You know, so because what we had was essentially a full service recreation center that also had an ice rink. And, um, and yet, so many people that I talked to thought it wasn't, thought that it was only an ice rink and an Olympic pool and it was only gonna be used for outside events, and it wasn't really going to uh, alleviate the shortage of recreational facilities for the people, which, I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. And, and uh, so I'm not sure that, um, I, I, I think that um, if, uh, I think that, that the people who want influence in the city should always do so with the best interests of the city at heart and maybe watch how thoroughly they judge the best interests of the city um, for themselves. Well, I would like to uh, comment on that. I think that's a pretty uh, prejudicial statement. So you're basically saying that the citizens, the 63% of the citizens who voted against this issue were either deceptive or uninformed or not able to understand things, and I disagree with you. And all I can say is if you decide to punt this and force us to take a petition, then I can almost guarantee you that when you come forward with an arts center proposal and a convention center proposal and a library district proposal, all things I've heard this council talk about, I can guarantee you they're going to go down because the citizens are not going to put up with it. That would be my suggestion, that you don't take that approach. We elected you as leaders. All right, Councilmember Peck. I, uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. All right, Councilmember Peck. Oh, so, sorry, hold on, sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I don't think that the, that the citizens were deceptive. I don't think the voters were deceptive. I think that many of them were deceived. And I take a lot of the fault for that onto the city because I don't think that we did an adequate job of explaining to people and messaging, and that's why we need, as Dr. Waters said, an after-action review. Um, but I also feel like the public debate from the opposition to this um, did take a deceptive approach, and nobody ever says that because of that approach, the people get nothing 
for another year. Um, and I think at some point we should remember that we live in a representative democracy and rather than saying our leaders aren't listening, maybe we should say our leaders are not trusted. I'm willing to sit down with every, every message I wrote on this matter and go through it with you line by line and see where you think that was deceptive. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Um, Mayor Magley, the, the one thing that you said I think is part of the messaging that you said you knew where you wanted the pool to go, but it isn't where we want it to go, it's where the residents want it to go. And that is where we didn't pay attention. We just didn't. They came up several times saying they'd been promised for 20 years that they, and we didn't listen. We just didn't listen. So, um, or take action on that. Um, that is just one tiny part of, of what happened. And I do think we should discuss it because it is their city. They pay us, they elected us, we work for them. Um, with the, uh, with the staff has done very good job in the past with having community meetings. We did it about uh, marijuana. We had a huge thing about marijuana. We met about gun control. We did it about um, homelessness, huge two or three meetings. We even this summer had three meetings about uh, homelessness and the service that is provided around that. So we do have interested community members who will give us input, but I don't think we listened on that one subject. Well, I just don't think we did. And obviously, I mean, the data supports your opinion, right? I mean, meaning that your statement, the data, I mean, it lost. However, but the, uh, but then again, I mean, Southwest Longmont, you know, again, they're, they're, I mean, they're just one quadrant, right? right? You know, and so, and so, I mean, and plus the other thing is, yeah, so I mean, my point was that I didn't get to pick where we where we put it my point was that so many i mean everybody wants the rec center within not next door because that would be too much traffic but they want it just far enough away that they can get to walking and then everybody wants it in their location is my point and i mean you're right maybe maybe we should have but then again uh i, I mean i'm exhausted of the topic and the thought of going out again and starting again when there's so many different opinions and viewpoints, if it's not going to pass, you know, it's, I really, 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 really want the facility, right? Yes. But if it's not going to pass, it's just okay. more wasted time. But go ahead. Um, I agree with you. Everybody wants it in a different place, but that is where council takes in the input and then makes plans. Mm -hmm. So the first one that we would do is over here and then maybe five to 10 years or when the bond is paid off, we would put one in another place. And that is how we plan for the future. The, you know, we were not even going to put a new bond out. We were going to be, we were going to reauthorize the bonding for the uh, rec center in the museum that came due in May of 29. That fell through. So we ended up with, with having to figure out a new funding concept. Um, so it turned out to be a different conversation in my than in 2015 because the, the money issue was different. If we could have used that bonding and reauthorized it and just continued those payments and put in a rec center, I think that would have made a big difference. That was a good plan and, and it fell through. So I, I agree with you, if we, if we get community input and as a council we say this is what we can do today this is where the majority want it, but in 10 years when this bond is paid off or in 20 years, we'll put one over here and stick to it. Don't deviate because that's the frustration of the people from my point of view. Good point. All right. Council Member Rodriguez. Sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> I appreciate the, uh, the dialogue back and forth on this issue. But I would just like to uh, request that we move forward with the public forum and, and try to keep our, our dialogue amongst council members to a minimum and more interaction with the public. Go. This is just a request, please. All right. The uh, Councilmember Martin. I just wanted to clarify that when I um, asked the staff why there was no location 
on the ballot measure, it was because unless we knew it was funded, we would not spend the money on the extensive study to find out where it would get a, a facility would get the most use. So, um, you know, it wasn't some kind of a deceptive thing, and I do want everybody to know that, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore. All right, let's go on to the next one. So, Stephen Weber, you're 18. Paul Fagerberg, you're 19. Brenda Holton and Carla Blakely, you're 20. So, Mr. Stephen Weber. No, 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 no. These are, so there's a total of 30, I was asked at break that there's a total of 31 people on the list and they want to know where we're at. Just human nature wants to know, oh my gosh, how much time we got left. Mayor Mr. Begley, Weber. Mayor Begley, members of the council. Stephen Weber, live at 1111 Longspeak Avenue, Longmont. Uh, appreciate this today, having this so if people can come up and speak. I think we need to do it more often. Uh, there's so much stuff that gets covered. I'm here tonight. Uh, just to talk about three things, uh, quality, of ish quality of life issues, and, uh, and I uh, grew up here in Longmont, and the stuff you guys are dealing with, with the uh, growth and all the other problems, is not new just to Longmont, this is the whole front range. Uh, Colorado's changing. Uh, being a native and being raised here, I have a little bit different perspective than some of you might have. I, uh, I represent a lot of population in Longmont that was raised here, grew, grew up here, and uh, I represent fixed income people, people that don't like the growth and don't like the, the things that come with it. I understand that we have a lot of issues with homelessness and building houses and all that, and it has to be a balance. Nobody said this was going to be easy. This is what you guys are here for. Well, I had a chance to sit, that, but when I was sitting back there, I had a chance to reminisce 20 years ago when I used to come here and uh, we used to discuss things back then. And I remember being on the, the committee or some kind of a get together we had on, on Vision 2020. <clears throat> and what Longmont wanted to look like. Well, we're here. And Longmont talked about capping out at 100,000 people. I don't think that's going to happen. I think things change. And I think we're going to have to be smart about growth. We're going to have to be, you know, balancing it. And I, my, my concerns is, you know, there's three things that, that concern me tonight is traffic, open space, and safety. Uh, traffic, as you know, if you drive around town now, it's, it's a mess. And you, you might have new people coming here that don't think it is because they compare it to other places. And that's okay. But people that have grew, raised here, grew up here, we don't like it. And it's, 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 it's a hassle to go down the YMCA to 9th Avenue and go to the old town west part of Longmont on Main Street. They have to take that long and traffic jams on Main Street, it, the, just about every street you go. And that, that's one of the things that I think Longmont put the cart before the horse. I mean, we should have planned out this development as much as they have to realize that the streets can't handle all the volume. And that's, that's something that, you know, I think... I think we have to come together and, and people have to have that dialogue, the dialect like, we, like Gordon talked about. Sometimes I think that the, the, the people that I represent here tonight, I think they don't have a voice. And I want them to know they do have a voice. And I want you guys to know that there's people out there that care about Longmont, uh, you know, and, and some of the stuff that's uh, making it not, a, not appealing to us. Uh, the other thing, you know, you worry about all the time and deal with is rude drivers. I mean, that's, that's, it's just part of the problem we're having. More people, more problems. But another thing I, I'm concerned about is I think we need more of is open space. Uh, what made Longmont special and what living here all these years, I took for granted when I was younger, but I, the older I get, I realize how important it is that we don't lose it. But we need open space. We need wildlife habitat saved. We need areas that, that, uh, that have that because we lose that. We're just another city. And Longmont's always been, been known to have farms and St. Rain River going through it. Keep it wild, you know, and some of the things that made Longmont special. I don't know if you guys saw the paper a couple weeks ago about that study where they had the Audubon Society doing their bird count. And they had the sixth year in a row, sixth year in a row, the, the, the Colorado State bird wasn't even found. And, you know, the last six years, you know how much growth we've had, how much stuff. We've got to protect these areas. We're going to lose all that, you know, and that's, that's something that's important to a lot of people. 
You know, this is it's ridiculous that we have to, you know, not be able to talk about it. In, but I don't want to get sidetracked. But uh, the other thing was safety. Okay, there's a lot of issue with crime. I talked to a lot of people. I know a lot of people. I know people that are concerned about safety. I know that uh, you know we have to be able to take care of the people here and make them. People need to feel safe. And if they're not feeling safe, then there's something that's causing it. So I don't know what the council thinks about with people wanting to move because uh, I talk to people that, that are having to move because they can't afford to live here. And, and there's some stuff that we have to talk about with that. I mean, services keep increasing. And sometimes I hear from people in the paper that are writing, writing stories that, well, this, this, this county or this state or this area has a, a higher rates than we do. So we always kind of compare to what other people are. And I think we need to think about what Longmont is and what makes Longmont living here special. So we need to keep that under control, too. Yeah. Uh, nobody's in the queue, but I, I, I don't know if it, what other, I, I agree. I agree. And the question is a lot of times, um, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same traffic, right? And I'm, I'm always thinking to myself, what can you do? What can you do? And uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's an interesting quandary. It yeah, is. that's why and, you... And, and it's an interesting quandary. And uh, I don't know what's causing it, but um, I know what's causing it. Longmont's a great place to live. You know, if you would have Colorado's told me, a great place. And I think yeah. we're living, living Colorado to death. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's something we're going to have to deal with. And I just think if we the more open space we can acquire, more wildlife areas, more things that make Longmont special, I think we'd be ahead of the game. I mean, the other communities have to do what they have to do in their own places, but Longmont needs to take care of Longmont. Yeah. Agreed. Councilmember Martin? Thank you. i just like a qu clarification. When you say we're concerned about safety, are you specifically asking about traffic safety, or are you concerned about crime? Uh, because safety is a pretty broad subject. Well, I don't, think the, I don't think the Longmont Police Department really put out in the paper how many things are really going on in Longmont. I, uh, I think sometimes it's kind of hidden. The people don't need to know what's going on, and I think it's a lot more crime than people think. And I have talked to people that have been affected by crime, and I'm talking about crime to people and, you know, different things like that. And, and something that bothers me, and I think I need to bring it out, is, uh, is uh, there's a, a, a gentleman that died in just July that was murdered in his house. And I want to know if policy in Longmont has a policy that keeps people from knowing if the illegal alien was part of the, the crime. And I want to know if that's something that comes from you guys, a policy, or is that from the police department? So, so I'll, I'll take that one. So right now, um, all in, so there's two issues here. One is reporting facts of a crime. Um, and so the paper, the police, and I think the paper do a great job of open, being open and transparent. But here in Longmont, we do not uh, report or even ask someone's documentation or immigration status. Don't, don't so, the citizens have a right to know, though? So the, the, the question is that, um, so can I see your papers? Yeah. No, right, right, right now, can I see your papers? What papers? Your immigration papers. No. Why not? Because I don't have them. Are you illegal? You know what? That's just that's just that's no, no, sidetrack no, on the whole no, no, thing. No, no, no. My, my my point is, is. That, my point is. So I'm, I've been a, I've been an attorney now for twenty years, right? And so and and not once. I mean, the, the, I mean, it never even comes up in consults. You know, so when someone's arrested, you know, we don't the, the police department, Boulder County, they don't typically ask a person's immigration status. It's not relevant. You think crimes are committed by illegal aliens? Um, not all, but some. Some, I mean, I mean, all, all over the country. So, so my, my, my point is, so my point is that if you were to look, right, if you were to take a hundred people, both people who are documented and undocumented, white, brown, black, etc., right, you're going to find that there's a proportion. I mean, discounting the act of entering the country without documentation, right? You do have some people who enter this country who are committing crime is that who killed gary hawkendale so i don't know to tell you the truth well i, I think they have a right to know and so so again 
I don't know that answer. So as the mayor, I don't know. I don't know if anybody up here knows, right? I don't even know if the police know. So, but the point is that we have a policy not to report to the federal government someone's status because we don't ask. So for example, right? I was married 25 years to a Mexican citizen who had become a natural Some of my US best citizen, friends are. Right? So my, I've got three adopted Latino kids. I've got one daughter who's biologically Latina. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone asking for their documentation because they were all born here. I understand. So, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's suppose that my boy who's about to turn 16 gets picked up for a DUI, right? I don't want that cop going, let me see your papers. He would respond just like you did. You're distracting. It's like, wh what do you mean? What does that have to do with anything? You know, so it's, it's a, it's when, a, when people's lives are in, in, in danger mm -hmm. and it's, it's proven fact that some are committed by that, mm -hmm. I think any one of them would be enough to be able to question that. It, and is this a, you know, it's a long run, a sanctuary city where we don't, we don't let people know. We, no, we, we are not, a, we are not a labeled sanctuary city, but we certainly act like one. Oh, oh wait, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, no. hold on, hold on, hold on, no. one second. Ms. Hinton, you're going to have to sit down, okay? I, I know you're upset, but that's okay. <laughs> so, no, I know you are, but still. Hey, but so, still, it, hey, 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 uh, I understand people are upset, right? I understand it, but we're not going to start a mob. Got it? That's right. Thank and you. So, all right. So, the, uh, so, we don't report, right? Ms. Hinton, if I hear one more word, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. No, I, I, I mean, okay. You yell every time you're here, and I'm not, I can't do that anymore. Okay, please don't. Um, I, you know, I'm representing some people in Longmont, and, 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 I, I, and I talk to a lot of people, and it's nothing that it's nothing ever comes up of, of, of discrimination or anything like that. It's a, it's a thing that's going on in our country and in our city. And, 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 and I, I'm just asking. And, and so and so you are so statistically speaking, that this is true, right? And I understand that you might have this concern. Statistically speaking. You are more at risk being in your home with your partner than you are with someone who is undocumented. M meaning, the, the, what, the, the crime in this community, first and foremost, is domestic violence and crime within the home. Yep. I and two, is, our, is tr not homelessness, not poverty, but the transient population in town. So those are the two categories. Um, you, you would rarely, most people who are here are trying to stay below radar, who are undocumented, are trying to stay below radar, contributing, working, struggling, not wanting to draw attention to themselves, which if you are arrested, whoo, then, then you have problems. Then you have to spend $10,000 for an immigration attorney and all that stuff. So, so so we're not going to cover it all tonight. Yeah, yeah, this right. is so, something that people are, don't want to talk about, and, and, and so, it's not like... We can't talk about this another time and, and be able to come together and to have dialogue. Right. So, but I appreciate your concern, and we're going to move on now. All okay. Right? All right. Great. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. All right. Paul Fagerberg. Good evening. It's just my luck to follow that guy. Um, my name is Paul Fagerberg. I'm a resident of Longmont. Uh, I'd like to present to you a hypothetical quote from a politician. Nobody is trying to take away your right to an abortion. We just want common sense abortion safety laws. Before you can get an abortion, you have to undergo a background check. There's a waiting period, too. And we're only banning certain types of abortions, not all of them. Now, if a politician said that, would any of you believe them? Of course you wouldn't, because you know what they really want to do. Now, I'm not here to take a stand on uh, that very, very uh, volatile topic. Instead, I want to help you empathize with gun owners. Senator Feinstein says common sense gun safety laws, but gun owners can only hear her famous quote, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. I am strongly in favor of common sense gun laws, but they have to actually make sense. Colorado already has universal background checks. In 2017, there were over 7,200 failed background checks in Colorado. These included 31 people convicted of homicide, over 1,300 people who were either under indictment for or already convicted of assault, and 252 people with active warrants for their arrest. 
a little over 200 of those people were arrested. So less than 3% of the people who illegally tried to buy a gun. California has had universal background checks for decades, but they are one of 10 states, according to USA Today, that does not investigate or prosecute people who lie on their background check forms. Where is the common sense in that? We absolutely need to keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. Unfortunately, there are certain politicians who have decided that pretty much everyone is the wrong people. So you'll forgive me if I don't trust them to implement any common sense gun safety laws. After every mass shooting, we hear the common refrain, people have died, thoughts and prayers are not enough, do something. 3,000 people died on September 11th, 2001. Our country did something all right, this is what we did. We have the TSA molesting travelers. We have the famous naked x-ray scanners, racial and religious profiling, an incredibly expensive war that has produced no real and lasting benefit, wholesale surveillance of American citizens with no regard for the Fourth Amendment, and the nearly unlimited expansion of presidential power. Do something indeed. Our country would be better off today if we'd done nothing but offer our thoughts and prayers. One of the common things that I hear is that nobody needs an assault weapon and a 30-round magazine for self-defense. During the LA riots of 1992, police did not respond to the areas where the riots were active. The news showed pictures of people defending their homes, their businesses, and their families with guns. Pictures like this. This man is holding a Daewoo K1A1, which is very similar to the much maligned AR-15. It has a pistol grip, it has a collapsible stock, it has a flash hider and a 30-round magazine. Those are the very features that made it useful for self-defense in the first place. Don't tell me nobody needs an assault weapon to defend themselves. Don't tell me nobody needs a gun to defend themselves. I got my first concealed weapons permit in the middle of 2001. A few years later, I was in another city, didn't know the area. Um, I made the best of a bunch of bad choices to walk between the restaurant and my hotel. Two men came up to me and they were about to attack me. If you've ever heard the saying, don't bring a, a knife to a gunfight, these men had also heard that saying because as soon as I pulled my jacket back and put my hand on my pistol, they were no longer interested in stabbing me for my wallet. I didn't have to draw my weapon. I didn't have to point it at anybody. I didn't have to shoot anybody, thank God. I am so grateful for that. But I have no doubt that if I had not been armed, if I had not had a gun to defend myself, and by the way, that gun had a magazine that was more than 10 rounds. Actually, it was 17 rounds. So even under Colorado's law, that magazine would be illegal today. If I hadn't had that weapon to defend myself, I have no doubt that that encounter would have turned out much differently, and I wouldn't be standing here today. I think we should always beware of people who gather power to themselves or they seek to legislate against groups they disfavor, like gun owners. It shouldn't matter whether we agree with their philosophy or not. Shoes have a way of ending up on the other foot. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Brenda Holton and Carla Blakely, you're number 20. I've got to ask, what's the dog's name? Jordan. Jordan? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Um, I'm Brenda Holton. I live at 1446 Mayfield Circle. Good evening to all of you. I'm talking today for representing uh, Grand Meadow Property. I'm a property manager at Grand Meadow Mobile Home Park. It's a senior plus, 55 plus park. Um, yeah, can you just just speak into the mic? They they do want to hear you. I'll I'll reset your time, so okay. just get up there real close so everybody can hear. I'm a property manager at a senior mobile home park on 821st 17th Avenue. I'm here to represent the residents of the park. My questions are about the application on the property of 833 15th Avenue owned by the Faith Baptist Church. There's an application right now by Scott McFadden that is looking to buy it for uh, five apartment complexes and 156 parking spaces. The unfortunate thing is that they back up right against the mobile home park. Their propers are want to proposition a 16th Street Avenue. At this time, they're not putting it in, 
but our concern is when they do decide to put it in, that it's gonna take 14 to 11 mobile homes away from seniors, vets, and disabled people. So we're just trying to get jumped ahead of the game um, that, you know, that this would be due. And they say that this person is dedicating 30 feet of land for the next, uh, for the road, which is ridiculous. That's maybe a sidewalk. So you're losing quite a bit of our, our mobile home park, which most of these people are in extreme fixed incomes. They talk about low income housing and all of that. These people can't even afford a $900 one bedroom apartment because they're on about 870 a month, period. So right now the land is continually going up that they're having to pay rent on, which is going up considerably because it is owned by a corporation. So it, every year it goes up. So, I mean, we're talking about, oh, the homeless, the people of low income, when do we talk about our seniors, our vets, our disabled people that are on very, very fixed incomes? When are they taken care of or seen to? I mean, maybe Longmont, which should be one of the first cities to have a senior cap. I mean, what would be wrong with that? Colorado is one of the few states in the United States that does not have a senior cap. So, I mean, our seniors, need to be taken care of. They've worked hard. What do you mean hard. senior cap? I'm sorry. Senior cap for rent cap. Okay. Well, you rent can't cap. limit the amount of seniors yeah. we have. That's so long. I could get <laughs> them all hats. Just, just making sure we're Baseball clear here. Hats. But I'm just saying that, I mean, we don't take really good enough care of our seniors, our vets, or our disabled. They're not taken care of. They're pushed to the side because they're not going to live much longer. Well, they're our history, our librarians. They're everything, and they've worked hard all their lives to, and they don't have 401k. They didn't have it way back when. So now they're set with this amount of money. So what we're concerned about is 16th Avenue going in, taking one of Carla's homes and quite a few other ones. I mean, that's a lot of people losing homes, and there's no place for them because they can't afford the apartment complex. I know that they're getting 900 for one bedroom. So how are these people going to afford that and have no income? I mean, it's just, it does, it's absurd. So I'm wanting the burden possibly to go on the landowner. Why is it not going on him? He's building it, and the congestion and traffic will be completely caused by him with five giant complexes, 156 parking places. So, and then on top of it, when they're backed up with all this construction, all of the dust that's going to be coming into the seniors, the noise, the everything else, and we already have a problem with people using the park as a thoroughway to get to 17th Avenue um, through the park, which is private. A lot of people go from that park, jump the fence, and come through to 17th Avenue. Because I work there, I know, I see them every day. And we're getting people that are siphoning gas, stealing things. And when you ask them, this is private property, you need to leave, they don't do it. I did talk to the police officers. They gave me great ideas to put no trespassing signs up that were fixed, that then we could call them that it was private property. But there's been a lot of problems with that. And I think there's going to be more problems with that complex going in and then people trying to jump the fence to cut through to get to 17th Avenue. So, I mean, I just think that there's some issues with this that maybe should be looked at before it's completely passed. She has... Uh, yeah, I want to know. I, uh, I'm Carla Blakely. I live at 831 17th Avenue. Um, my mobile home will be taken out by 16th Street. I live on Social Security. I can't afford nine hundred dollars a month, so I'd like to know where am I going to go. Let's ask them. Are they? Are we making a Sixteenth Street? Let's let's get that answered first, right? So, and then you can keep. I mean, let's keep. You can keep talking, but I just want to make sure that if there's an issue, let's talk about it, right? So this is in the development re review process right now, and um, we have an interesting situation there in that there is right-of-way that the city had and they built on the right-of-way in some places and other places we don't and so what i would say at this point is is we are looking at this and we understand the impact that this has on 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 the people that live in that area 
Um, this, frankly, is not unlike um, this, the situations that we've run into um, as a product of the flood and how we looked at the Royal Mobile Home Park or we looked at the other mobile home park that's um, north of the St. Vrain, north of Left Hand, when we had to do this. What I will say and what I've said to them is it is not, um, nor will it ever be, our desire to displace someone and not have um, an option for them if it were to come to that case. We don't know that we're going to hit there yet. We're still working with the engineers to figure out how we can design that road. If for some reason, and I've said this to council members who've asked this question, um, we would approach this just like we did on those homes that were impacted by the flood and find a solution that takes into account the individual circumstances and how we move forward. It is a firm policy that the council has set for us and that we have for ourselves is you don't take someone that's housed and make them homeless. That's not what we want to do and that's not where we're going to go. Um, so what I will say is we're working to find solutions on this. There is no definitive answer at this point. Okay. So, so Ms. Blake, let jump in here. Thank yeah, you sure. so much. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm, uh, this is my client. And I did talk to the housing department for the um, – Can you can, the get up into the department. microphone? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I did talk to the, uh, the planning department, and um, basically what we're just asking is – is kind of a guarantee to make sure that they um, will have housing if this goes through. So I, I, just, I, did, I just heard it from the city manager, and we haven't taken a vote, but I'm pretty sure that you got seven council members who are going to make sure that you're not homeless, Ms. Blakely. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, just yeah. a real quick question to or you is, um, is the right of way on our, our side of it? Because I don't think – that when we were looking at the map, it did not look. It looked like it was on this side of us and the other side of us, but not the us. There, there is some right of way where they built on as part of the park into the right of way. Now, and I have also heard that that there was actually that the church owned some of the places that the mobile homes are at this time. I think and that's I the right of way. There's, there's some land issues there, and that's what we have to look at to really work on. But right. we do know that I just looked at the map with some of the right of way we own. The mobile home park did build on that right of way. Okay, but is there still a thing called in Colorado squatter rights? I mean, she's been there 18 years. So isn't it kind of weird that all of a sudden you now have a right of way because you, you deemed the land necessary for 16th Avenue, but it wasn't way back when. So. I, I don't know how does that work. I, it's just that kind of is. Yeah, this de you know this developed the way it did. I I don't know exactly when we've had the right of way, but we've had the right of way for some time. Right, uh, but you didn't access the correct. right of way or didn't try to take it at any time. So at some point there, I thought there is a squatter right kind of thing in the state of Colorado well, after so many years. Well, yeah, you're, you're talking about, you're, you're t yeah, you're, you're take, talking about adverse possession. Right. And I mean, that, that's, that's a little complicated. It depends on a lot of facts. Yeah. But what, what I would do is it's rare, I, it's rare right. that people come to council and be able, you can say that I left with a win. You're leaving with a win. Me, me, meaning really? that, yeah, me, meaning that you just. Because I have heard stories no. where somebody sat on a piece of land long enough that no, no, they ended yeah, up owning it. And up. that, and, and I, I don't know if you're a client, you're a realtor or attorney no. or what, but, but I mean that you can always go talk to an attorney and find that out. But even if you don't, it sounds like city city staff is going to follow. Is they're going to make real? I mean, with the Royal Mobile Home Park, yeah, they did not displace people without making sure that they had a and better some option. And that was affordable that they yeah. can afford. Yeah, because a lot of these people are on eight seventy a month. Yeah, literally. So honestly, the way this would work, and the way that we work through these issues, is we would bring our neighbor Karen's group with Kathy Fedler and Carmen and we would work it in multiple ways, the first thing that we're going to look at is really work with the engineers in terms of design and see what that looks like. We're, we're not at the point to say unequivocally, yes, that has to happen. We're also not at the point to say that we can come up with a different alternative. What I can say is anytime we go through this, my expectation and all of our expectation is, is, is that we do everything we can to avoid a negative impact. And if there is one, 
we will work with the individual to assure we will not my goal in anything we do is if we do anything we have somebody in a better position after this versus an, a, uh, a position that is more negative okay well oh no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. no, no that's great if, and, and if the city council can guarantee that won't happen as far as um you know the many, many times individuals like this um as you all know um on housing lists and things like that um, there's a certain amount of uh, of the income that they they uh, they can spend on housing. Usually, it's about 33 percent. So, if it's possible, that can be worked into that too. I mean, if you guys can guarantee that this is not going to happen, wonderful. I'm gr I'm uh, uh, you know I'm grateful for that. At the same time, as long as I don't think they can. So, I, let me put it this way: I can gar I can personally guarantee that Ms. Blakely is going to be fine. Wonderful. At the rate at 33%. Yep. Wonderful. We right. worked through all of those issues. Cool. All right. Appreciate it. Thank Personally. You. All right. Cool. Thanks. I would like to ask, um, why won't planning contact me when there are meetings and all of that? That I don't know, but I'm betting that if that guy right there, yep. that guy right there, he'll make sure that you're, you're responded to. And if not, call any one of us and we'll make sure that he does. Okay. Thank you very much. You all, all right. have a great evening. All right. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember Christensen. Come back. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Blakely, we've talked before, and I know you've talked to Councilman uh, Hidalgo Farn. And um, I'd just like to point out that Ms. Blakely has lived there a very long time, and she doesn't just live in her trailer, it's her community. So it's not just a matter of finding her another place to live. That's her community. And that whole um, um, mobile home parks are the largest unsubsidized low-income housing in the country. And we should do whatever we can to um, make that a little easier. Um, uh, Representative Edie Hooten has done a lot for trying to get some issues uh, solidified for mobile home parks um, statewide. Um, but uh, I, I'm just curious why we would put 16th Street through anyway. So, so let me be, um, Dale just came up and gave me more information. In terms of this project, this project's not requiring 16th Street. Okay. Envision Longmont is requiring 16th Street. These are the things that we need to go through. Um, in terms of why things were allowed to be built where they were and how that developed, um, happened many years ago and, yeah. and, and so that's why we're we're saying in when envision says it needs to be here we're saying okay? we want to evaluate it to find other options and to see what we can do yeah because it's of supposed to be about this. creating neighborhoods and preserving neighborhoods not Correct. destroying them yeah okay and, and i just said and until we get through all of this what i can yeah. say let's go ahead and take a five minute okay. break please but that doesn't give people let's go ahead and cool. let's go ahead and break
no hay azúcar. It's aspartame. But there's no ordinance on aspartame. That's true. If, if the mayor came down, you know, I'll say it. But. All right. Well, you have. Yeah. We want a sugar coat. All right. Let's go ahead and keep going. We are two thirds done. So. The next ones are Bob Norton. So 21 is Bob Norris, 22 is Joan Hollins, and 23 is Sherry Malloy. Okay, I'm Bob Norris, and a, a petition my neighbors are. Is it on? Okay. So I'm Bob Norris, 532 Ryder Ridge Drive. Let me tell you. I can't tell you how disappointed I was when that gentleman came up and talked about illegal aliens, and none of you responded correctly. None of you. And I offer to bring somebody in to train the council on how to talk about immigration issues and how immigrants that come in are four times less to commit a crime than those of us born here, and the safest cities in the United States are those with the highest immigrants. Please, learn how to talk. Okay, I hope I haven't wasted all my time. Um, I want to thank the City Council for their interest in early childhood education. We've had a number of events. There's a growing number of people. We even allow tall, bald men in our group. I won't say who. Uh, but anyway, I've been on the board of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition. We train home daycare providers. And I'll tell you, in the last several months, I've learned a lot more. I thought I knew what I was doing, and I'm still learning. But so let me tell you some of the things that I've discovered and, and done, and I've, uh, you'll get a copy of this. Uh, so here are benefits of quality early child education for all. Children are more likely to arrive in kindergarten classroom school ready when, uh, which means gaps in vocabulary and background knowledge are reduced. They're more likely to graduate from high school and secondary school, which are associated with greater housing security and reduced homelessness. They're more likely to attend college and graduate from college. They're in, going to enjoy a substantially higher lifetime earnings, and they're going to pay more taxes as adults. And that's where I kind of knew a few months ago, but now I begin to realize that there's an increase in career earnings and an estimated $2.6 billion in a federal income tax collected if we provided everyone with early childhood education. And by the way, the biggest impact is zero to three years. Um, parents will have a better opportunity to purchase a home in their family. They'll not lose social benefits. They'll not, uh, they will pay more taxes and they are less likely to need benefits. So when we invest some money in early childhood education, there is payback from that because there will be more people working. Uh, just to add a comment, the, the Longmont Economic Development Partnership says the two biggest problems they have bringing in businesses are housing. We talk a lot about that. Early childhood education and daycare, we don't talk about that. We don't invest enough money, although I'm real... Uh, thankful for what the city council is putting into that this year. Um, businesses would recruit and employ more talented employees. They would lose less employee time as working parents often stay home with their sick children. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates that's about 20% loss of time of employees. Higher than I thought, but I'm going to believe them. Uh, and parents would spend more money in the community. Um, the community could attract new businesses and talented employees. So uh, one of the things that struck me too is in one of the discussions I read, you know, the people that work in daycares, I know some of you have been involved in that, aren't paid very well, yet they have to charge a lot. If we could get around that, these p people that were paid more, they would maybe be able to buy houses, maybe, and they would be paying more taxes. So it's a very complicated thing, and we need to make the public realize what an issue we have here. It impacts 
40% of the kids and their parents, and in fact, all the rest of us. It actually impacts a lot more people than homeless. If you look out now, the kids that were to go through a program where they have quality early childhood education, by the time they get out of high school and maybe in college, they're gonna keep uh, Mike Butler a lot less busy. Okay, so th there's just so many benefits to that, so I, I would appreciate it. And I would also mention that the other thing that's being done and needs to be done is bring the parents and the teachers together. The Parent Coalition has a program that brings teachers and parents and the principals together because the parents need to know more about how to educate their children. We need more interaction between parents in the school district. So, thank you. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Okay, so first of all, hello Bob. Hi. Um, I wanted to respond to, so I had been, as the man was speaking, I had been looking through, trying to find any evidence that, and I know what crime he was talking about. Um, it looked like this individual was a transient. He was not undocumented. So there was no evidence. So that was clearly an offensive, racist remark based on assumptions because this individual is Hispanic. Um, the term is undocumented. It's not, I mean, that it was definitely a point of being derogatory and being racist. I was planning, instead of carrying into dialogue and going back and forth with an individual who was clearly not at a space to listen and comprehend and even understand what I'm getting at, and it would have gotten us nowhere. I do intend on speaking with John Fryer at the end and giving my point of view. Um, in dialogue that I've had with educators, with legislators, with community folks who are on different walks of life, there, there is a time to discuss, and then there's a time to take it in and voice, voice it in another outlet, if you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at. Um, I just felt that this, this forum, this to talk to him face to face like that, I was not in a space either. I was, I was really heated. And I was not ready to articulate what I wanted to say in a calm manner. So if that, I mean, you know, we have to respond to in a degree that where we, where we feel as, as representatives, where we feel we can be most impactful. And I felt, for me, I couldn't. Plus, I was trying to find any documentation or any evidence that this person was undocumented, and there was none. He's just Hispanic. He's Hispanic. So I, I found that truly offensive. Um, the other thing is, um, and I do appreciate the work that you're doing with the early childhood education. Um, for 10 years, I taught preschool. Um, started with the two-year-olds. And then once I had my degree, my teaching license, I moved up to the four and five year olds. Um, and the importance of educating and having those um, quality opportunities or quality education for our youth, especially our, our infants. Um, research has shown time and time again, when you read to your, to your infant, the likelihood of them uh, attaining a high school degree and or college degree, just it skyrockets. The data shows that it is it is important to have those opportunities. Um, what is the, because I know the school district is working, we have Spark in the school district for four and five year olds. So is there, what kind of collaboration is being done between the school district to handle the four and five, the three and four year olds as to put, so the city can put more effort in the, um, put more effort on the zero to three. Is there any kind of discussion around we that piece? We really haven't had much dialogue with the school district yet. Mm -hmm. um, but let me go back to, to what you were first saying. Um, mm -hmm. It's important to make comments back of what that guy said and correct mm -hmm. it. You're not gonna cons change him one iota. No, no, I'm but not. But there are people listening. Yes. And that's just like when And MP that's why I intended to speak, I'm sorry to interrupt, to speak with the newspaper about this, but I was not in a space, I was really mad. I well, was yeah. really heated and I, I, 
wanted to refrain from saying anything that I might regret on public record. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's why, that's why I, I offer to find somebody to talk to the council about how to respond to these mm -hmm. things. Angry response don't get you no. there. I get angry too easy as I get older. But I'll give you an example of something that really disturbs me. I listen to NPR, and they interview somebody, and the person's obviously lying, and, it, and then the interviewer doesn't say anything. Now somebody says, ah, that must be true. I heard it on NPR. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be careful that we respond appropriately and not just to the person that's talking, but to the community as, as a whole. Uh, and I, I've been calling Councilman Christensen, except that there's one difference here, right? And it was going through my head. I wanted to respond like you guys, but when somebody's at that dais, it sucks. But welcome to America. You get to say what you want. And, uh, uh, I mean, we can respond, but, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't stop, if that makes sense. Well, I understand you couldn't stop them, yeah. but you could say, please understand that this is the truth of the matter. The mm -hmm. matter is immigrant men in all age groups commit crimes at one-fourth the rate of what mm -hmm. us uh, and I, 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 tr I, did the, just, you know, I did the best I could, but yeah. going from traffic, open space, and... Yeah. And okay. I, I, I was just, I just like, what? Huh? What? Huh? Uh, just under, <laughs> understand. To, to, to try to come up with an argument on the spot is difficult. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm offering to bring somebody to council to say, when you hear this, this is what you need to say. No, we appreciate it's, it. It's diff it's, if it's difficult otherwise, because you're just talking from your gut and your anger. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Hi, Bob. So mm -hmm. I appreciate all you're doing with, um, well, I appreciate all your comments, but um, given that this would be investing in early childhood education would be enormously helpful for businesses. Yes. We know how, how much it helps them, and yet they don't. This could be a benefit. They could get together as uh, groups and um, invest in one per block or one per mile or something. This would be an incredible benefit to their employees who would not have to drive forever to get to their kids. Um, and yet they don't. They don't seem to think it has anything to do with them. Well, so what I would ask you to do is to go around and talk to some businesses, talk to the chamber, talk to the Rotary Clubs, and just point out to them that it is their responsibility as citizens and as um, members of this community to have something to do with the children and not just stick it on those parents who are not probably not being paid enough to actually afford child care for their children. Yeah, we are working now. We met with uh, Jeff Nagel, who's the plant manager at Schmuckers. Mm, great. And, and That's great. He's, I asked him, is because some companies have their own daycare. Yeah. Right. Uh, he said that their corporate does, but they're not ready to do it. They're new. But he said he would help us any way we can. We've met with um, Morgan Smith mm -hmm. of the Longmont Economic Partnership, <laughs> Development Partnership. I don't know why I have trouble with that. It's okay. So anyway, he's part really contributing into it. And we're trying to... Uh, create an event with the chambers. We've already talked to That's the great. chambers. Uh, uh, Councilman Waters has been heavily involved in that, and we met with the cabinet member of the governor's office, and we're trying to get the governor to come in that kind yes. of a meeting because if the governor comes, that draws a lot more people than even Tim does. Speaking of which, Tim? Oh, go ahead. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. So just building on on um, what Bob's talking about, there you know, there's just a ton of momentum that's kind of materializing around the goal that we set as a council. <clears throat> I think the interest is broader than just Longmont. Uh, but Scott's last name is it Gronsky? Gronsky? Gronsky, I think. Gronsky uh, is the whole, carries the governor's portfolio on mm -hmm. at least early childhood. I think probably a variety of other topics as well. Um, but he's indicated the governor would be interested in or willing to meet with uh, uh, business, both small business chamber members uh, as well as primary employers. So 
both our local chamber and uh, LADP have both stepped up to say they'd be willing to co-sponsor a breakfast or a reception of some kind. The governor's indicated an interest in meeting with them. Uh, executives, EPIC, I'll, I'll miss the acronym, um, EPIC, Executives for Pre... Uh, it, there's a business, a business coalition that developed. If just Google EPIC Denver Preschool. A uh, business coalition that started in Denver. I knew nothing about EPIC until you know, a few months ago. And a woman by the name of Gloria Higgins, who was one of the co-founders and now does consulting work, uh, sometimes through EPIC and sometimes parallel with, to EPIC, but is kind of in partnership. Um, she was instrumental, as my, my understanding, in bringing together business, uh, business owners, big and small, employers in Denver. That's grown into, according to her, a statewide coalition. Uh, she's willing to be part of whatever event occurs and, and bring what she can from what's happening around the state and in the, both uh, the, the investments and the benefits that have occurred to big and small employers, right, in terms of increased productivity, decrease absenteeism, et cetera, because of the investments they're making in, in early childhood programming. So along with uh, the, the, the screening that Councilmember Peck mentioned on the 30th, right? I mean, that, I want to reinforce, I think that'll be a really important uh, and, and significant opportunity. Uh, I think closely on the heels of that will be something specifically with the bis business community. And I'm, you know, I'm pleased that our, our business leaders have stepped up on this. So thanks. Yeah, this has gone from four, as somebody called old guys, I prefer youth with experience, but anyway, to about 40 people in, in, in coming in. And we're going to have some podcasts. You might mention that. So I, the, the Backstory podcast, I've had a chance uh, that, and you know, the good fortune to, to do as a volunteer with the Longmont Observer on a variety of topics. But we got queued up three podcasts in this month in, C, in series. One, kind of the big picture of uh, child care and early childhood education challenges. Uh, with an all-star panel. Bob is part of that, along with Daniel Butler, uh, Richard Garcia, and Jessica Erickson. Uh, we're going to have a second right on the heels of it um, on early childhood education. What, what are we doing or not for four- and five-year-olds? And we've got, our, we've got a variety of providers, uh, Wild Plum, uh, Matt Eldred from TLC, Amy Ogilvie from Wild Plum, uh, actually Ann Maka, uh, who's running our informal education program through the museum, um, and um, who am I forgetting? Oh, Christina, Christina Sims is a panel, and then we'll do a third one on child care. And, um, you know, what, what are the needs? I have to say, across the board, uh, we have a long way to go, and we're way ahead of an awful lot of other communities. Uh, so there's a, uh, Bob discovered just recently from the Economic Policy Institute a couple of studies that I, he was pulling from from his comments tonight. It would be good to get that to all of us, or I'm happy to share it. It's, there's yep. some really powerful data. And part of the data are, are the, the, it's a big ticket, the kind of investment we need to make everywhere, right, uh, to, to position early uh, um, employment in the early childhood care space to be competitive with other employment opportunities, like a huge number. But part of the analysis of what, at least is in this set of studies, is that within 20 years, whatever that cost is, is earned back through additional tax revenues. And in every year afterwards, it's a surplus. But we've got to, we've got to start. If, we, if we're serious about high quality, we're not going to get high quality, reliable child care and early childhood education if we don't compensate those folks working in that space in ways that are comparable with their K-12 uh, counterparts. All right. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. All right. Okay, Joan Hollins. Uh, do I have this right? So, uh, sure, just speak, okay. lift it and speak right, right into it. Um, so Joan Hollins and this is my husband Kane, uh, 1400 Third Avenue. And... Um, I've talked to a couple of you guys before in the police and several past council members over the years, uh, several years, um, about the traffic on 3rd and Francis. And um, I've 
Like I said, I've reached out several times, um, and I've been told various things that it's going to be taken care of, or we have plans down the road, or whatever. But um, while everyone's trying to figure out what to do next, it's getting really horrendous. Um, and it feels like we live on a speedway. Uh, we live on the corner of 3rd and Francis. Um, speed is 25 miles an hour. The weight limit is 7,000 pounds um, empty on trucks. Um, but every day, uh, especially you know when people are commuting to and from work, we deal with massive amount of speeding. Um, there's a stretch between Gay Street and Sunset that's just straight away. And human nature, I guess, you just can't help but floor it going through there. Um, it's really as simple as holding people to the law, perhaps. And um, I have talked to the police, and they will usually respond momentarily. But um, I don't think I've ever seen a speed trap or seen someone get a ticket out there at all. See a lot of accidents, especially um, where the restaurant is now with all the cars parked on the side of there um, and everyone flying through there. Um, and we are a boom town, and traffic is getting worse and worse, but I don't know what we're waiting for to mitigate. Um, we're just going to keep waiting. But in the meantime, we're talking about sustainability and quality of life and coping with growth tonight. Um, and we're not asking for anything other than um, a little mitigation with the speeding, which, like I said, is horrendous. And um, maybe some pedestrian walkways. Right now, it is almost impossible to cross that street to go visit neighbors. I had a friend who tried to come over the other day, and it took her five minutes to be able to get across the street. So once again, I'm appealing to you guys to please give us something to improve the quality of life and not make it get worse. I'd also just like to say that um, because it is a high traffic area, it is an ambulance and fire route uh, that um, it's zoned residential. And if it's zoned residential, then it should comply with those residential restrictions. Uh, as soon as it's uh, zoned something else, then I think that you could raise the speed limit or whatever that's going to happen there. But as long as it's residential and our property values dictate those residential values and those zoning laws, then they should be abided by. Uh, so, you know, a crosswalk, a speed bump, a stop sign, a roundabout, something there that's going to uh, slow people down just a bit so that it can continue to be a residential area uh, and a pedestrian-friendly neighborhood. It's the old neighborhood, so it's not Or like return to it. Yeah, at least. All right, something. All right Council Member Peck, I'm sorry. Do you have anything oh. else? I didn't mean to cut you oh, off. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, hang out a, you know, like 7 to 9 p.m., or a.m., rather, um, or in the afternoon and see what it looks like. It's horrifying. And it sounds like a, ra it, like a racetrack on some, mo almost every day. Um, the other thing is uh, aftermarket modifications to engines and mufflers are out of control too and really unpleasant. And again, I, if it's illegal to modify them, I don't know why you, I could go down on Main Street and get that taken care of and make an obnoxious uh, car to drive around town with. I don't know. But anyways, thank you. Uh, hold on one second. Councilmember okay. Council Peck? Thank you, Mary Ackley. Um, I, I'm on TAB, the Transportation Advisory Board, and I have brought up with them a crosswalk there at that restaurant because I think I agree with you, so I'll bring it up again at the next meeting, and if I can get your contact information, which is on this sheet, then I'll let you know. But the speed bumps are a problem because, as you mentioned, uh, fire engines and uh, ambulances, et cetera, go down there. They can't handle those speed bumps. 
they're, uh, they have to slow down for them. Um, so that, that might be a problem with that, but I'll definitely ask at the next tab meeting what we can do about this. I agree with you. I live there as well in that area. It just gets worse and worse. I don't, I've talked to all the neighbors within you know, several blocks up and down third. I don't think I've talked to anyone who doesn't agree with that. Everyone's and, and agrees that it has just gotten really bad. It has, I agree. So could you write down your contact info? It's not on the list. If you could hand it to oh. Council Member Peck, that'd be great. Okay, All yeah. Right. All right, I could just email you. I'll send you an email. All right. Okay. Um, All right. Council Member Christensen. I just live up on 4th and Judson, so I, I can appreciate the problem. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of it on 3rd Avenue c comes from the fact that until you get to Main Street, if you're east of Main Street, it's a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And then they hit Main and they don't slow down. And they come off of Hover and they're going 45 miles an hour and they turn and they don't slow down. We have put a couple of those big signs up. The, the guy, uh, there's a guy who lives down on, um, just south of the golf course, or just west of the golf course. He says that has helped a lot in his neighborhood. But then they forget by the time they get up to sunset and they're just barreling along. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, it is, I do have a lot of sympathy for the situation. It's, and I worry because there are a lot of kids crossing over, a lot of dogs get loose. And, oh, I've seen several you know. get hit out there. Yeah, um, I know. Fortunately, and I don't want to say fortunately, dogs and not children, but. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is a concern that we need to try to do something with. It's it's dangerous for me to work on the yard out there. And even though we've appealed before to the city for some kind of mitigation, uh, the city never really uh, took but one day to come out and tell me and give me a notice that those branches that are overhanging the road need to come down. That was pretty expeditious on the city's part that I needed to take action. And so if, that, if that's the kind of action I need to take, perhaps the city could respond as uh, efficiently as well. Councilmember Martin. Thank you. Um, I'm the ward representative for that street, at least on one side of the street. I'm pretty sure I've corresponded with you yeah, a number of times and uh, a number of your neighbors as well. And every time that happens, I have a conversation with Jim Angstead or, or Tyler Stamey and they tell me what they can do, what they can't do, where you are in the queue, and they seem to be operating with the best will in the world and their limited resources, but I understand your frustration completely because it doesn't ever seem to turn into concrete action. Um, I am going to suggest tomorrow, you see, <laughs> hear that, guys, um, that um, in terms of the plans for uh, traffic mitigations, um, that we need to make the cue for that kind of mitigations public so people understand um, what the known problem areas are and why they are prioritized the way they are and maybe even how much the mitigation that is, ex that is suggested will cost. Um, because I know we can't do all the mitigations at once, all the things that are needed. I know that some of the things that re would really help a lot are just completely out of the financial range of the city, but you have a right to know and we do have a right we need to make everybody understand what the traffic science is and and how how we can really work together to address things. Maybe if this is public, we'll understand the patterns better. Um, and and so that's that's my suggestion because I'm I, I am with you. I you know we keep going back and asking the same questions and getting the same answers and. I don't want to overcommit the city, and I do try to understand both sides of the question, but 
you can't just keep asking. We need we need to we need to fix our traffic problems, and there's got to be a better solution than just widening all the roads because we've been hearing earlier that you know the problems that that causes. Um, we got to get smarter. I do want to say uh, we are discussing that at our city council retreat too, and so that'll be a good thing to hope for. I have uh, had responses by drivers to slow down uh, by standing on the street with a hair dryer, and they uh, seem to think that's a, a sort of speed <laughs> trap. So I, I have. didn't cost a dime. All right. Thank I you. like that idea. Uh, we, we've been asking for mitigation for over 10 I years. I know you have. And we get nowhere. And I, I think if, if the answer I hear is it's a major artery. So there's, mm -hmm. and it's the major artery. And if that's the case, it should be a priority. If, if, if you're gonna keep telling us like, there's no way through town but third, then something has to be done. And, and we can't budget in a crosswalk or something to try to just make it a little more pedestrian friendly. Um, and it, yeah. All right. We trimmed our branches right away, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and your branch trimming. Thank you. All right, Sherry Malloy. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. Sherry Malloy, 2113 Range View Lane. I'm here to address four important issues. My theme is please keep it simple and protect Longmont's quality of life. My first remarks are about our our long our about Longmont's waste services. In February, staff will be doing a presentation about where we're at in terms of landfill diversion, costs, et cetera. You will be given options to improve service to residents. We're incredibly fortunate in Longmont to have municipal services for waste, giving us not only some of the lowest rates in the whole state and region, but a lot of control regarding flow, goals, accountability, and transparency most of which are not available with the rest of Boulder County and the state, which are privatized. Having municipal services keeps things simple. It also affords quality of life protections because residents have input in service options. Next month, you will have a huge opportunity to improve services to residents, reduce our trash, pr trash production, and greenhouse gas emissions. Some simple ways we can help do this include, one, provide universal composting like recycling, and embed the cost of compost in all trash and recycling subscriptions. Number two, require that all multifamily complexes, privately contracted trash haulers, provide both recycling and composting for their residents. Three, create more options for hard to recycle items, and especially electronic waste. Longmont used to partner with EcoCycle to have two hard to recycle events per year in Longmont. These were hugely successful and need to be brought back. There are many other suggestions. Our SRL Zero Waste Group will be suggesting ne next month, so stay tuned. My second subject is residential metro districts. As you know, metro districts are a Tabor workaround designed so developers can make more money and set up financing that's non-traditional by passing their upfront infrastructure costs to future residents. Metro districts do not keep things simple for anyone, not for future residents, not for this or future councils, and not for city staff, especially as a couple of you are advocating for very narrow and specific criteria. The complex service agreements and the necessary oversight enforcement of these agreements is the antithesis of keeping it simple. We have a perfectly good system and process in place for development in Longmont. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Please protect future and current residents' quality of life in Longmont by removing the ordinance the former city council approved last February and reinstating our previous ordinance. My next subject is a second recreation center. The ice arena and aquatic facility failed last November. I was strongly opposed to this proposal for several reasons, but mostly because it would only serve a small fraction of our community. 
Longmont needs a second, rec a second full service recreation center with additional swim lanes. As I've said before, my dream is for Longmont to have a second recreation center and, like Denver Public Schools, that all Longmont stu students be given a free summer pass to use both rec centers. When the library master plan is comp completed, perhaps another library branch could be included with this. It would be pretty cool for kids to access a recreation center and library side by side. This is a simple solution to an overcrowded rec center, a serious lack of swim lanes, and a beyond capacity library that was built for 60,000 people. This would improve quality of life for Longmont residents. Please consider putting this on the November ballot. I'll personally commit to supporting that campaign. Finally, I'll end with applying these two themes as they pertain to the land development code updates. This spring, you should be revisiting the recommendations the consultant Clarion is incorporating from the Wildlife Management Plan per Council's direction. This has been a long and challenging journey, and the end is finally in sight to protect our quality of life in Longmont by providing safeguards for our wildlife and habitat. The Sustainability Evaluation System, or SES, continues to be reviewed and refined by planning and, the, and our staff and the city attorney. The original intention of developing an SES was admirable, with the purpose being to identify things that are important by looking through the lens of economic, social, and environmental impacts of proposed development. Unfortunately, it's gotten very complicated with legal concerns severely constraining the application of this tool. In the spirit of keeping it simple, I'd like to suggest that if you want the higher standards the SES was attempting to address, these values be identified and codified into the Longmont Development Code. Out of time. Thank you. All right. Hold on. There's nobody in the queue, but thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, 24, Lynette McLean. Mayor Bagley and Council, I'm just going to leave things. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about Metro Districts again. I have a little more time. Um, I just want to say for people who don't know, not for the Council, because I know you are all well, well aware, but just uh, Metro Districts, um, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I've, I've studied your, the handout that you had last, uh, last Council meeting. Uh, and I've done some research um, just on my own, but I get what I'm hearing is developers loan themselves uh, money to develop uh, their uh, their their their, um, their development each project, and then they set up this very complex set of rules so that to form a tax district, which they govern themselves, and um, the residents who are not involved in setting this up, who haven't bought the their homes yet because they aren't built, they're going to pay a monthly tax to pay back the debt. And usually this tax follows the residence when it is sold. And um, the tax district is managed by the developers, a board of directors usually, and it's there's some effort to get residents to work on that, um, to, to serve on the board. So that's just kind of in a very, nut, a, a very small nutshell what it is, but it's very complicated. So I just want to ask a couple questions. Some are rhetorical, and others I, I really like an answer. My ret first rhetorical one is, what is the fight here for the Metro District? Why, what's it really about? It feels like there's just a lot of energy and a lot of passion, and I just wonder if it's really about Metro Districts, or if there's some promises that have been made, or if there's something going on behind the scenes. It, it makes That's where there's some lack of trust here, and I just wonder wh why it's such a big deal. I wanted to know on this uh, thing that you that was s said that uh, Marsha and um, and uh, Mr. Waters, Dr. Waters wrote if uh, any developers helped you write it because it it felt like maybe there might be some developers that helped put this together and if so I wish that there would be some names on the develop naming the developers but I want to ask that question and then. Um, I wanted to ask why you weren't working with your council. You're working with the developers. It feels like much more closely, and I really wish that you'd work with your council to try to figure this out. Um, questions that I wanted to see if we could answer 
um, that I just really had some questions about a metro district is what is the percentage? I mean, I know that uh, Tim likes the the data. So what's the percentage of metro districts that build luxury homes? I'd like to really know that. And then on the other side, what percentage of metro districts include affordable homes? I'd really like to know the answer to that question because I, I think that we'd probably find that met most of the metro districts are for big luxury homes. because And also because people who are in, um, able to pay those taxes would be people who have you know, a lot of income. Then the other question is, what do you think the perception is of residents in the metro districts who are living in, in affordable homes? So people who are make, not making very much money who live in metro districts. I'd like to hear what they think about living in metro districts. What I've heard from people who are living in a, a fixed income is they avoid metro districts at all costs. They, they won't buy a house if they know if there's a metro district. Um, also, so those are the questions I have. Um, but in, in um, metro districts are really expensive. There's a huge cost in setting it up, regulating it, managing it, and even after the metro districts paid off, it has to be managed. It has to be. It's still a tax. It's still a metro district, even though um, the, de the debt has been served. There's still fees uh, to to run it. Um, and then you argue that you should get residents to be on the board, and that's not feasible because nobody really wants to be on that. When you get on an HOA board, you get on it because you know you're going to get to pick the color of your house. You're going to get to make sure you get a new roof. You're going to get to be involved in the landscaping. But when you're on a board of a metro district, it's already been done. It's a done deal. It's a, it's a debt that was uh, incurred before you were ever around. Nobody's going to want to be on that. So it's not that doesn't – that's not um, – Feasible, really not a feasible suggestion. And I and the, they were telling us that residents don't like to serve them. They have a hard time finding residents. The other thing is a fight can really be costly. If things aren't being done right, it costs a lot of money to fight, and residents have to come up with that cost. And, of course, the metro districts, you saw the 10 lawyers that were here. Um, they have a huge cadre of legal experts um, to fight any... any um, any fight there is going to be. Uh, Longmont doesn't want our city council to spend their time. We really want you to do other things. There's so many things that, to work on, and we just don't want you to spend the time on these metro districts. There's regulating the oversight and all that, so we don't want that. Can you guarantee to us that the members of the metro district board are going to be fair, that they're going to be skilled, that they're going to have the knowledge to, uh, to, to develop these? I don't think you can, unless it's, unless it's the developer themselves. And then the word in your paper here was called deplorable. There's more than enough risk to refuse to use this flawed tool. So I hope that you will really not use it. Thank you. And I forgot to start it, so I, start, I, oh, had, I started it at four. Do you have anything else to say? I have one more little thing to well, say. Why don't you go ahead and say it because okay. I forgot. To. I was going to say that there were two problems <coughs> with Meadowbrook already, you, the first one that you did. One was that they indicated they were going to eliminate term limits, which is already a problem. And two is that you were going to build infrastructure, and they're going to have a pool. And so we're going to fund a pool that's going to be um, not for our Longmont residents. We need a pool, but it's going to be an exclusive, and people are going to have to pay memberships. So the flawed principle of, 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 um, of loaning yourself money and passing that debt on to underrepresented future residents is an untenable model. And no matter how many uh, r rules and regulations, it's just not tenable. That's all I have. Here we go. <laughs> you don't have to answer any of my questions today. If no, you no, want no, to, no, we no, can no, talk no, about no, it. No, no, people are in the queue. Okay. No, no I, I got okay. it. I got it. I just, I, I don't said, want to keep everybody no, here till midnight. No, 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 no. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's about time we have some real meat. <laughs> Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Lynette, if you don't want to keep anybody, everybody here all night, I'd suggest that you make fewer unfounded assertions. Yeah. So This one had a lot of unfounded assertions in it, too. I think it didn't. So f to answer your first question, wrote every word of it myself. Good. Didn't consult with anybody Good. except um, a lot of information that was online, the statutes, um, a number of other publications, and um, I can tell you that um, while we consulted with a lot of developers when we were developing the affordable housing uh, 
uh, ordinance, which mm -hmm. has been tremendously successful, mm -hmm. and the inf oh, we can we consulted with the Longmont Economic Development Partnership when we, uh, a as well as a number of other organizations, when we looked at this the package of incentives and cost saving measures for developers so that they could build the things that we wanted. Um, we didn't do it specifically, I didn't do it when I was um, regarding this paper. But what I did do was I watched what happened after we passed the development, uh, the, the uh, affordable housing incentive and ordinance package. And what happened was that developers started coming to us with proposals that aligned with the city's vision instead of just being what they always did. And I think that's a real good thing. I bet you're not against zero energy, zero carbon, all electric neighborhoods. And that was one of the proposals that came to us when the city of Longmont allowed metro districts. You said, last time you spoke about this uh, at council, that Mountain Brook was for rich people. Do you know the value of your own house that you live in now? Say, do you know the Zillow appraised value of your house? Mm -hmm. How Are you willing to tell us how much it is? I think it's about 460000 something like that. Uh-huh. Okay. And the average price of a projected price of a Mountain Brook home is less than 350000 and it does include transitional housing for veterans, and it includes mountain uh, habitat homes that are not taxed. Um, so again, unfounded assertions. Meadowbrook, Mountain Brook rather, is, is not for rich people. And so we really shouldn't go around saying that but just because it sounds good. Well, I think that project could have been done without a metro district. I think it was planned, and it could have been. It could have happened without. Well, a metro actually, district. that's not the same. The same builder has another project with about the same housing mix uh, on the other side of town that doesn't have a metro district. Exactly. But that other how that other development not exactly the same. It doesn't build a reliever road to. Uh, address the traffic on Hover. It doesn't include habitat do home donations. It doesn't include the Veterans Community Project. Um, so there are a lot of differences. It doesn't. In it doesn't include completing a, a, an envisioned Longmont planned greenway. So um, again, because there's a metro district. Um, some of these things that needed to be done in the area where Mountain Brook exists mm -hmm. that didn't need to be done out east could get done. And what happens instead of the developer getting more money is that the developer makes the same margin he would and sells the houses competitively but does more for the city. And I am convinced, and if you had read that document clear, uh, without prejudice, I think you would be convinced no. that. <laughs> now that's really admitting to a prejudice, because what if you're wrong? You're sure I'm wrong. No, I, I, I think the other way around. I don't think I'm going to convince you of anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm apparently not going to convince you yeah. of anything either, yeah. but nevertheless, I think that factually the horrors that you're presenting can be, can be prevented in Longmont. You made the argument that um, most uh, metro districts are for uh, high-end housing. But one of the suggestions in my paper was that we only allow metro districts when the average home price is below a certain threshold. You can't just get a metro district that pops up out of thin air. The city council has to approve it. And if we write ordinances 
that put limitations on metro district, then the city council can't improve a metro district that doesn't but you match won't, those ordinances. You won't be here in 10 years, and there'll be a different city council. Well, in 10 years, if the city council wants to change that, they would have to repeal all of the ordinances, which yeah. would be kind of a tell kind that of they were trying, that they were going to, yeah. that they were trying to get back in the pockets of the evil developers, because they'd have to repeal all those ordinances first. Yeah, it'd be hard to do. It'd be hard to do, and that's why I want to put in the safety ordinances mm -hmm. now. So... I really would like to at least have you give it a shot. And well, if you I, would like... Let's try this one, and then we'll see how we've it goes. Got this, you know, yeah. We've got this one, let's and, wait. And, and let's wait, let's wait but let's years. in the let's meantime see. not say anything bad about it. Well, you what know? about the people who, are, who buy their houses for, you said 350000 is the average? Yeah. And that so that means the bank said, well, you can afford a house that would cost three hundred fifty thousand. Uh huh. But the bank didn't say plus a metro district. So these people are buying their houses and they're going to have an extra well, two hundred dollars a month. Actually, the the people who the, and the bank knows this, by the way. Maybe. Um, Maybe not. <laughs> My bank didn't know a, when when I was buying a house that I had, had was buying a house in a metro district. They didn't know that. Well, you should probably use a more competent banker. Oh, okay. But um, <laughs> uh, but if it, but they'd know if it was in Longmont because because the disclosures are there. You know, um, I was talking to a developer, um, not about you know, it was after writing that paper. But I would like to say that that the developer was talking about um, putting the metro district in the brochures for selling the house because the um, one of the things that they could tell the home buyer was that their entry price for that home was forty thousand dollars less, fifty thousand dollars less than it would have been if there were no metro district, and that while their property taxes would be higher for a while, that that would end, and, and at the end of the taxation period, they would have paid $40,000 less on their mortgage plus their taxes than they would have if they had had no metro district, but had the house, the house cost $50,000 more. Now that's pretty hard to argue with. I don't know, I mean, <laughs> Why are you laughing, Lynette? Because it's not pretty hard to argue with. If well, you, what's the argument? If you, if, you do, if you do the math and do $200, I don't know what the metro tax is, but if you do $200 a month times 30 years plus the interest, it's a lot well, more. Well, it, it's not. It's, it's a lot so more So you're than saying 40, that I'm lying so, about the no, math. No, I'm not saying you're lying. It's just a lot more than $40,000. No, 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 no. You save $40,000. I know, but I'm saying if you pay an extra $200 a month for your metro tax, then it's, so that's going to be more than $40,000. Here is, here is the deal. The interest rate on the house, okay, on the mortgage, which is 50000 the home, the mortgage is going to be $50,000 less than if you didn't have the metro district. So the interest rate is 4 to 5% now. Okay, the mill levy even if it, when it's at its maximum, is far less than 5% on the house. So if, if you figure it that way, then you see that your overall cost of the money that you're paying for your house is lowered. And don't look at me like that. Don't look <laughs> well, at me I like I'm wanna, telling I'm just, some story. I really don't want to take not. anybody more I, I mean, time. I'm going I'm to jump in just yeah. because okay. we're going to have Thank a metro. You. I mean, we could literally, yeah. mm -hmm. this particular topic, starting a, start starting our metro district conversation yeah. at 11 o'clock at night. Exactly. It's exactly. coming up. We're going we're gonna to all yeah. have a chance. And Thank we still you. have um, one, two, three, four, five. Five more citizens to go through yeah, before we I don't end want the night. To do well, that's so fine, Mayor Bagley, but I have been challenged. I have been called a liar. And I I've didn't been, call you a liar. You told me that I didn't write that paper, and no, you I told me tell I you. was I didn't not tell you that, that I hadn't done the math. I asked you, and <laughs> and um, I didn't tell you that you didn't write the paper. I asked you who wrote it. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you that. I didn't say that you were a liar. I 
I said that you have, if you did, we have to sit down and do the math. Because I don't know the interest rate. I don't know how much a month. It, there's, there's a lot of unknowns here. Well, and they're not unknowns, and though, because they were linked me, to you're a lecturing spreadsheet. to me, and that's, I, I don't really, I don't, we don't really need oh, to Oh, I don't appreciate you saying things that aren't true either. All right, well, on with that note, with okay. that, with that, do you have anything, do you want? No. All right, so Dr. Waters and, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Waters and Councilmember Christensen, you're both in the queue. Dr. Waters? Thanks. I'm going to move that we extend the meeting past 11 o'clock. A second. Let's vote. Michelle's like, don't. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That passes unanimously. I Council do want to try to respond to some of those. Those are they're okay. fair questions, and okay. I want to try to respond, okay. respond as thank you as uh, as transparently as I can. Um, the uh, the question I don't remember exactly how you framed it, Lynette, about you know is there a deal made somewhere in terms of positioning on this? The, the, the best I can reconstruct the whole flow of conversation uh, is that when we when we got serious about an inclusionary zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I am one of the council members who was willing to listen to developers on if you want us to stay in the game, you know, we want you to hear these kinds of things. Because um, me part of the message was there are things you, you wouldn't have to take a dollar less as a city if you just did a few things if you're going to charge these fees. And one example was paying uh, the sewer and water fees at the time at, at the certificate of occupancy as opposed to when it was permitted because now they carry the cost of that money for two years or whatever and and the the, the example was we pay you a buck and a half you we, you pay, we pay you a buck and it costs us a buck and a half to pay you the dollar right so help us with the cost of money right in terms of when we pay fees well that made sense yeah so things like um, I mean we don't collect any less money and uh, and it costs them less and they can if they pass along the cost or the savings, right, that's critical that they pass along the savings. So that was one of them. There was a, the conversation about credits. Um, uh, why would we allow a credit and why wouldn't we contr control or constrain what a developer could do with a credit? At the end of the, end of the day for me, it's like, well, if somebody builds, gives us 20% of a development, 8% above the, the, the goal of 12%, and we give them a credit. Well, I don't care what they do with that credit, personally, as long as we get the affordable housing. We get more affordable housing sooner if we, if we factor in a credit provision. So with that, there was that kind of conversation. One of, the conver one of the number of things was you have, Longmont has, a prohibition on the use of a metro district for residential development. If you, if you lift that prohibition or amend that ordinance, we can finance the cost of construction differently than we're financing it right now. So here's the example. And, I, and if I'm wrong on this, I'm willing to be educated. But I've, I think I've seen it play out in terms of the numbers that you two were talking about a minute ago. So, so, what, whatever the cost of infrastructure, ultimately, homeowners are going to pay for it, right? I mean, whether they borrow the money in a construction loan at 9% or they create a metro district sell bonds and the bonds are the interest is paid at four percent that spread is pretty expensive though over the over the cost of you know building their development so the, the at least the argument is that if i can finance my development and i can pay less for the cost of money right i can rather than me borrowing money or taking my money out and, and in investing it at the, at, the, at the end of the day the same homeowners are going to pay for the cost of that development so the question is, what does it cost them to pay for the cost of development? Or what does it cost me as the developer? So in, in moving forward with this, a, a threshold for me is if you're going to use that tool, you can, I, will, I won't support a tool, the, the use of that tool, if it doesn't help us advance our housing objectives. Right? I was explicit from day one. Mm -hmm. So when the Mountain Brook development came forward, among our housing development, uh, among our housing goals, uh, are number one: every development will have at least 12% of the units constructed as permanently affordable, or 
people are going to write us checks for fee and lieu, right? So in this case, they de- for if you, if you go back and look at the numbers of units in that development, they exceeded the 12% goal through the Veterans Village in the, the eight units. Yeah. What they did, part of, the, part, of, part of the reality for us in terms of housing inventory, and this goes back a little bit, I think, to something that Sherry said in, in terms of what's perfectly good in, historically. What we've done is probably perfectly good if you don't care about attainable housing for working families, for police officers, firemen, teachers, et cetera. So when I, when as a candidate, I made a big deal about we are, we have got to do something, not just, not, I, I, let me state it differently, both and, four are, are, are uh, most challenged economically residents, those who qualify for subsidized housing and those who don't. The point was made to me, Waters, you know, you know what you're talking about. Teachers don't qualify. Policemen don't qualify for subsidized housing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not suggesting that they should. But what we ended up with, when we got into, our, when, and we got into the objectives we were trying to accomplish, and this is the reason why. For me, it's, I don't care. I don't, I don't have a big investment in metro districts. I do have a big investment in the kind of housing, not, I mean, psychologically and politically, in the kind of housing stock that's available for people earning zero to 60% of AMI, but I also care about those who are 60 to 110% of AMI. And there just wasn't housing stock here. So if you go back, and I'd be happy to sit over, down with, over a cup of coffee, if we went back to the, metro de, to the Mountain Brook development, one of the requirements that we stipulated, they brought, was a side-by-side comparison of the cost of those homes, especially those that were getting the mid-tier exception, right? We, f- we wrote into our ordinance. Mm-hmm. If you put market rate homes, so they're not permanently affordable, but we don't want them to be. We want the families that qualify and could afford the home, we want them to earn, start to earn their you know, lifetime wealth like we did, right? I mean, I, my wife and I started in a condo. Offer mid-tier housing, right? You don't have to pay us a fee, the developer. You're not subject to the payment in lieu. If you'll deliver market rate homes, that are priced for folks earning 80 to 100% of AMI. And then it graduate, we graduate, we stage uh, the fee. They, they, they do start paying a fee for homes from 100 to 110%, 110%, 120%, 120%. But if you go back and look at those mid-tier homes in the Mountain Brook development, and you do the math, which is what they did. Now, I could go back and check the math. I looked at it at the time. But I'd happy, be happy to sit and look at... At the at the cost, the estimated cost of those homes at thirty thousand dollar more, thirty thousand dollars more per unit. Then back, then back to this conversation. Yeah. Uh, calculate the mortgage rate, the mortgage rate, PITI. That's this includes the the property tax over the thirty years of a mortgage. Do the same house thirty thousand dollars? Yes, same same numbers, right? Add on the, the the mill levy rate. Run it out thirty years. The numbers came out where the, the mid-tier homes in the metro district cost less, the home of ownership, the cost of ownership over that period of time. It's just the numbers. I'm well, not, I mean, I'm not the, making that What about up. all the expense of paying for all the feasibility studies and the setting it up? And uh, Well, you're talking about the staff work. No, I'm not talking about your staff. I'm talking about the, develop, the, the developers setting up, doing all the paying their lawyers. And well, paying. that's all factored into, into the, whatever their cost of money is. That's all factored in. One of, the, one of the criticisms that we heard was how much time the, the, the staff spent reviewing that, metro, that uh, Mountain Brook yeah. proposal. And Part of what Councilmember Martin tried to do, and we went back and forth on this, um, uh, what, what we were trying to do was take what we thought we had learned in the run-up to that first decision. And we all studied. You know, we all learned a lot. I didn't know anything about metro districts. But we all learned some things as we went along. And she and I were kind of trading uh, thoughts. You, you asked why we didn't have other council members involved. I would love to do that, but not everybody was equally as enthused about engaging in it, right? So, um, so we ended up thinking, I, I, I thought we had a pretty good checklist, right? She, she turned it to a narrative. And it's not perfect, but I, just kind of a, as a sideline, you guys might want to make this wager. Uh, on the gun violence resolution a few months ago, one of my critics 
for bringing that resolution claimed that I that someone had written that for me. In fact, said wanted to meet me face to face. Say, you know, I want to know who wrote that because I'm gonna I'm gonna find you know. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll what my I'll make this wager with you. If you find that resolution anywhere in the world, but on this agenda, I'll sign over my house to you. No, I believe Not, you. It was, it was I was I was serious. But he didn't no, take me I up believe on. you. I just think there's some data in here that I would like to know where it came from, and that's that's I mean, fair. I, I believe you. I'm I'm not. So you know. in the in the back the back the, the the conversation wasn't a backroom conversation. In fact, your your question about that raises a question for me. Um, in the in the in the we in public discussions in this room and in the in in the library, we talked about and it, in fact. It was smack dab in the middle of the LEDP and the chamber recommendations. We talked about their 12 recommendations to amend that ordinance. So when we, when we got to the package, the ordinance plus other things, for me, it was, a, it was a matter of principle. I thought we had agreed. Now, obviously, not everybody shared this, but for Tim Waters, it was a matter of principle. But I sat here with other folks and said, we'll make that work. But there's going to be a high standard, right? You're not going to get to skate. So it was a matter of principle. I would have, you call, you know, call it whatever you want. The fact that there's so much, you asked, why is there so much energy around this? I don't know. I mean, I'm puzzled why, the, why there's so much energy around it. We all care. We're all trying to get to a bottom line. Yeah, that's true. That's more, better, diverse, affordable, and attainable housing stock for Longmont residents. If this is a tool to get us there, and we can do it with no harm, and obviously, that requires a lot of scrutiny. Why, for me, it's just why wouldn't we want to do it? You're just not. You're just not uh, young enough to see this thirty more years. Well, you know, you, <laughs> well, you asked. Um, I don't. I don't know. My HOA has their annual meeting tomorrow night. <laughs> I've never gone to our HOA meeting. Uh, I'm going to go tomorrow night because I don't have anything else on my calendar. Um, I don't have time to serve on the HOA board. But I know it's hard to get people to serve on HOA boards. But in, what's, here's what's interesting. As you think about uh, what you're able to do, I don't know all the constraints. If I was a member of a, of a Metro District board, and you didn't, I don't know what the relationship will be between Metro District board and HOA boards, but we will have a lot more control over, over a Metro District than we will over an HOA board. True. They're right. not accountable to us at all. I know. And I, I was a president fees. of my HOA. And tr trust me, it's very difficult because you never know who you're going to get voted in. So you in terms of transparency and accountability, yeah, you have more of both with a metro district than, we do, than you do with an HOA, yeah. actually. Well, hopefully. Now, who all wants to serve on them and how long they serve? Fair question about, about – I asked a question in page 235 or whatever it was of their application – why are there no term limits here? And their answer was, well, we're not certain how soon residents are going to want to serve on the board. And if, we're, if the original directors are termed out, we could end up with no one on the board. Well, okay, that yeah, made sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but in that case, the very first resident has, if they want, has the opportunity to, to be elected to the board. Well, I'll be anxious to see. So, um, I'd like to see it go. That's what I'd like to see before you do another one. Uh, can you get residents on the board? You know, I'd like to see that. Well, I, I just want you to know, this, the, the, at the end of the day, this is not about anything sinister. There's no backroom deals here. There, there's been more back... I, I suspect there's been more conversation about metro districts that I've been excluded from than I've been included in. So I don't know who's in the back room. It ain't me. <laughs> I've had my conversations right here in public. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, hold on. Councilmember Christensen. Mic microphone. Thank you, Ms. McLean, for your comments. Um, I would like us to return to actually listening to the, the people that came here to talk tonight uh, so yeah. we can leave. I know, I know, I know, but we've spent a lot of time, more time. And you're going to spend a lot more talking about metro districts if you do them. Yes, I know. I would also like to set the record straight on um, the package of incentives, which was developed 
at least two and a half years before um, either council members uh, Martin or Waters were on the board. And in that two and a half or three years, according to Kathy Fedler, we did not, with all the incentives that we gave, and we were far more generous than anyone in the county, we did not get one single unit of affordable housing, according to Kathy Fedler. So that's why we had to um, create a mandate. Um, I also would like to point out that there are statistics provided by developers. They're very different than from the st statistics provided by, for instance, Larimer County government, yeah. which shows that the average person in a metro district pays about 40% more than uh, the average person uh, not in a metro district. Yeah, I'm not ca calling... Uh uh, Marcia, a, a liar. I'm just saying I'd like to see the data because I it might be from one source or another source, and I I think they're going to be different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Hold on. Oh. Okay. Counts. Uh, Councilmember Martin. Um. So, Councilmember Christensen, I believe you're referring to a different set of incentives. You are speaking about yeah. the set of incentives that was put in place when the old affordable housing ordinance right. was was repealed, and there was a new incentive package that was put in place at the same time as the new affordable housing ordinance was there. And no. um, so, it, apples and oranges. Um, this set of incentives was made to dovetail with the new affordable housing ordinance, and they are different than the old package of incentives. Um, the only other thing that I want to say is that while some metro districts were allowed with no mill levy cap, um, no debt cap, no restriction against um, uh, right. uh, adding debt afterwards and stuff like that, um, yeah, some of those metro districts got totally out of control. And it took them 11 years to I get under them under I understand that. But, you know, this is a baby bathwater kind of a thing. What we want to do is regulate against that kind of abuse. You wouldn't want to not be able to have mortgages because... We had a mortgage crisis ten years ago. It's not the same. It's it's exactly the same thing. Um, and I'm speaking now, Councilmember Christensen. Um, so it's just it's it's a an amazing prejudice um, that we can't. We have to throw away a perfectly valid trans uh, financial tool to get the things this city needs because somebody was scared by a metro district when they were in the womb. I mean, it's representation without taxation. That's what it is. And it's wrong. Right. I mean, so, it's taxation without representation. Right. Sorry, so, it's, it's late. I've got to go, but I'm going right. to let you go. Yeah. go. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, we'll move on. I'm not going to talk about metro districts, but, okay. but uh, you, you asked a question. Why, why do people get so energetic? Yeah. Right? And so... And so uh, uh, I've, there's been a lot of energy on this council yes. lately, lots yes. of energy. And I think, I, I think that I wrote down, th I, I've been th I wrote down three points that I, I think that, that it goes to. And uh, sometimes, um, you know, it, it's not, sometimes it's not about the metro district. And now my fellow council members might disagree, but, but first of all, just because council members meet with people does not, not mean that you're in their pockets. Like, so for example, over my, I mean, just a few developers I've met with over the last eight years, Kevin Mulshine, Dale Bruns, Scott McFadden, Steve Tebow, Dave Chucknova, Roger Groves. Oh, I've had meetings one-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one, right? And yeah. they've presented to me what they wanted. But I've also had meetings, Gordon Pedro, Teddy Benjamin, uh, Don Haddad, Brandon Schaefer, Governor Polis, Zan Jones of EcoCycle, uh, Michael Belmont and Judith and Kay Fissinger and... I've listened to them too, right? right? So I mean, it, just because you meet with someone, a, a lot of times the language lately has been accusatory of if you are meeting with people or if you do not agree with me, 
there is a, a subtle, uh, allegation's the wrong word, there's a hint of if you do not agree with me, there's dishonesty, dishonesty, a lack of integrity, you must be cheating, you must be planning or scheming, mm -hmm. when really what it is is just a difference of opinion. Right now, now that's usually what it is with me with the people who usually show up in this room. Right. Meaning it's just, hey, I just disagree with you. We're on op I mean, we're either on different sides of the aisle or different. And so I get passionate. But then you add on one extra layer, which is, you know, um, there are members of this council that just do not like to feel as if they're being controlled, M meaning uh, well, nobody right? probably likes that. Right. So so I I'm one of them. So. So one of the people that helped get me elected originally, and I have much respect for her, uh, Franny Fallock Hood. I, have, I, I respect Franny. She helped me get elected. I don't talk to Franny much anymore. I remember I got a phone call back during the oil and gas wars. She asked me to do something I did not believe in, and I said no. And the way certain members of this council are in the, uh, interacting with you and the other group that got them elected reminds me very much of that. And so I think there's a, there's, a, there's a conflict of values where, I mean, I've heard it from, from you, Ms. McLean, don't forget who got you elected. And so you can either look at that as, we got you elected, you will do what we say, or we got you elected, and from then on, you just got to trust us. You know, I mean, it's no secret that Gordon Pedro and Tim Waters are best friends, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's, I think that there's a lot of personal conflict going on in this council where, it's not, sometimes a metro dist district isn't always about a metro district. Exactly. It's about, con I'm seeing a lot of power struggle, you yeah. know, a lot of conflict that has to do with personalities. So anyway, they're just my two cents. Thank you. So all right, let's go on. Thank um, you very much. All right, Wayne Cosina, congratulations. You have survived the night and you have arrived to your turn. Thank you. My name is Wayne Cosina. Oh, I live at 633 Stone Bridge Drive, and I am excited to be a Longmont resident. Not as excited as I was before 10 o'clock, but I'm excited. Anyhow, we, we moved in on December 30th into our home, which was built by DreamFinders Homes. And also, they built Clover Basin, which is another development to the southwest of us. And just as a side note, the HOA at Clover Basin has filed a suit against Dreamfinder Homes over construction issues, which kind of goes on to what I'm going to talk about. Of many, many, many issues I want to focus on, one, and it's a heating issue, because there is in our home, which is a two-level home, about a 25 to 30 degree differential between upstairs and the main level. So we have the, the thermostat set at 68. Upstairs, it's 84, mid-80s. And downstairs, it's 58 to 59 degrees. So constantly downstairs, we have to run heating units in the different bedrooms and different rooms. And upstairs, we got to leave our window open from 12 to 18 inches and run a fan in there to circulate air so we can sleep and be comfortable. Now, the builder has come out, um, and, and we identified this fact on, on our orientation walkthrough, which was on December 26th, to uh, Thomas Romero, who is the superintendent of this subdivision, so he was aware of it at that point of in time. And then on our pre-closing um, walkthrough, the problem still existed. And he, he said that they were aware of the issue and their warranty department was working on it. So, I mean, they closed. They forced us into closing on this home because there were huge uh, penalties if we didn't. Uh, which we signed a contract, which I'm not a lawyer. I wish I had had a lawyer there looking at it, and I, I wouldn't have signed that contract had I known that. But um, they, they forced us into closing on this home, knowing that that was an issue and not having it resolved. Now, 
when I start looking at this, oh, and, and so they came in on the 10th. Very HVAC guy came in on the 10th of January. And they put two 50% baffles in the returns upstairs. And on the 11th, well, we shut up the house. We, we turned off the heaters downstairs. We weren't letting in any more cold air. And it returned to the same issue, the same problem. Set at 68 on the thermostat. It was 59 downstairs. And it was 82, 83, 84 degrees upstairs. And so on the 11th, I emailed Tom and I said, the problem exists. Didn't hear a word from him until the 20th when I emailed him again. He says, well, we need data. I said, well, I gave you ranges. I told you what it was. No, we need exact data. So I said, okay, the day after you guys did this repair, we measured and this is what it was. So it comes back to me and says, no, I need pictures of the thermometer. The house has to be closed up for 48 hours, and you've got to show me pictures of the thermometer readings at that point. So, I mean, he's changed his tune three times, three times. Um, the, the issue I have is around the inspection. Now, inspectors came in, and, and I've been told it passed everything. And to me, this is a health and safety issue. I mean, you've got to consider elderly, infants, and people that are challenged health-wise. My family cannot live in that house with that temperature variation for 48 hours. We can't do it. Our health would be compromised. So... I, I don't know what to do about this, and I can't understand how an inspector could come in there and overlook this type of health and safety issue. And there are many other homes in the area. I've talked to, well, there's five of us that I know of personally that I've talked to, neighbors that have had the same issue, and I'm sure there's others. I put out a deal on next door. I'm out of time, huh? I put out a deal on next door, and... Within an hour, I got 20 responses from people, and a bunch of them from Clover Basin that says, you ought to know what happened here. So to me, there was a rush to close, and it's obvious why. They wanted to retire their construction debt, high-interest construction debt, and they didn't care what it did to the home buyers at all. I went in and I cataloged 249 construction defects in our house. Most of them were painting problems, but when the painters finally came in, the two guys, I walked them, they thought they were going to be there maybe 30 minutes. They were in there for six hours fixing the problems. There were holes in the sheetrock that had to be filled and patched. There was a spot on the stairwell wall that was bowed out because they had put the sheetrock up over a, a water uh, drain pipe and a, a joint in it. And rather than cutting a hole and then filling it up, they just put it over there and left it that way. Hmm. So to me, it was greed on the part of the, of the builder that they would go in and unethical that they would go in and actually forces into closing with all these issues and problems. Right. All right. Well, uh, uh, that sucks. I, I got that one request. Yeah. My request. Mm -hmm. And unless these people are challenged financially, nothing's going to change. And what I would request is that your inspectors do not issue any more certificates of occupancy to this builder until they resolve this problem on all the existing units. Okay, we'll talk with legal counsel and our staff about it. Okay. All right? Okay, and I would like to invite any of you to come out to my neighborhood. I'd be glad to take you around to my neighbors, let you see my house. Not sleep in there, though, man. That's too <laughs> no. cold, too hot. So uh -huh. thank you very much for your time. I'll Do sleep on the stairwell, it. right? Right where it's right 70. On. Council <laughs> Member Peck? Um, Wayne, yes. who's the builder? The, the builder is Dreamfinder Homes. Uh, who's I, the developer? I don't know who the developer was specifically. Who? HMS? Yeah. Interesting. Any 
Any other questions? Doesn't Thank look you. like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mayor, just yeah. so you know, um, uh, that email was forwarded me to me today by, I think, Councilmember Martin. And so we're interacting with the building officials and everyone else to, to look at it and understand what that situation is. I'll probably know more within the next two days. All right, we should probably look at it. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, Peter Longsfelder. Did I get that right? If you live at one, 1331 Walden. All right. We, we should have like the Hunger Games theme when we lose people, you know. Anyway, if you haven't seen Hunger Games, I guess, I'm sorry. All right, Margaret Halsey. All right. Canon theme, all right. I do know they're here. Scott Stewart. get this thing started here. <sighs> Mayor Bagley, members, council, Scott Stewart, 229 Grant Street, Longmont. What a great place. Um, yeah, I'll just read something real quick. Uh, I consider myself very lucky to have found Longmont 20 plus years ago. My wife and I have raised a family here. Um, we've tried to be good neighbors in order to build a uh, better community with our, in our area of influence. And I must say that my neighbors are awesome. I don't know if you guys live in a great neighborhood, but I do. Um, I started coming to council uh, meetings some time ago because of changes in how the airport operations affected my home. Increased operations have a large impact on the quality of life of those of us being affected. Over time, I've come to understand a lot more about the airport than I ever thought I would. Um, a serious look at the airport and how it is operated is needed. The airport lacks financial sustainability plan. Um, the, the lack of a financial, financial sustainability plan seems to be problem, problematic. Um, the airport master plan is often referenced as the plan. Um, the master plan talks about the, what the airport could be. Um, not about what the airport should be. The future of the airport development and the control is the choice, is a choice that the city can make. Increasing airport growth and air traffic will not improve the operational or financial challenges that the airport already has. The current airport size already serves Longmont Aviation community well. The rates and fees need to be addressed to allow for a more sustainable operation Avoiding FAA funding should be the first step to allow Longmont to take control of the airport. Longmont is currently looking at sites to install solar farms. Take a serious look at the undeveloped property on the south side of the airport. Allowing the airport fund to keep the revenue from the solar farm could help with its long-term financial plan and it could be a win-win. The airport gets the funding it needs, and the city gets the clean energy it wants. That's it. I appreciate you guys so much and the, uh, the dedication. It's really uh, difficult to keep up with all of the issues, and uh, you know, uh, I don't think you get paid enough for what you do and the level of commitment that you have to the city, and uh, it's greatly appreciated from uh, this citizen. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate that. You, you stuck around all night just to say that. That's awesome. All right, Strider, don't blow it, okay? <laughs> Pressure's on, my friend. Well, hold on one second. Get to the get to the microphone so that oh, the, the papers can want to hear. I brought a little sign that carry. I had to put directions because some people don't read uh, accurately. Kangaroos have joys, and trials have evidence and witnesses. So, uh, yeah.
Um, I thank you. This has uh, been going on about six or eight years. It's really good. Um, I appreciate the inter interchange. Uh, some people get it, some don't, some need it, some don't. But man, everything keeps coming up. The Hour Center, uh, Edwina's a good friend of mine, and I eat there quite often. Uh, not real often, but uh, they, I can get food. You know, when you can't afford food, it's good to have access to food. Um, I was uh, always hungry as a child, and here we get into the sugar thing. If you can't get enough food and you hear sugar is energy food, well, back then in the 50s, uh, that's when they, Cokes were everywhere and candy bars were everywhere. So you don't have enough to eat, you eat candy and Cokes because then you got a little, a little energy for a while. Well, when I was, uh, my last two years in high school, they took me out in the middle of track season because I had a series of heart attacks, which was partly no food, no sleep, too much salt and too much sugar. Um, I did set a record in my county that lasted for 10 years and a half mile, but I could have been five or six seconds faster. I could have set a record that would probably still hold, but life does whatever it does. I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez two weeks ago conducted a meeting that uh, the previous one was very contentious with the developers and, and such, and I thought that one went very civil, and this one tonight. Um, um, there's more issues to work out, but I um, instinctively went against metro districts because of my knowledge about opportunity zones. You create a special thing that laws don't apply to, and then... Uh, you know, that creates more severities. And here, I think the uh, ordinances we have had in terms of scrutiny over, um, I've gone from instinctively against to benevolently neutral. I need to learn more. And uh, But I think the discussion tonight, there's a lot of back and forth that really moved in the right direction. Um, a whole lot of other things. Um, my church, uh, Longmont UCC, built the MICA homes, which are just opening up right now. But uh, half of the church activists are in Puerto Rico rebuilding homes from the, uh, from the hurricane. Um, uh, today, the United States Senate put itself on trial you know they're going to acquit the president. He's only been documented with 15,000 lies uh, since he's been president and infinite number of crimes, but it's a kangaroo court. Um, and they already declared in advance that, uh, hey, you know, everything is cool. He can do anything. They make him a god, not a person. And um, I know about kangaroo courts. First time I ever walked into a courtroom, uh, was in Selma, Alabama, and I was immediately convicted for sitting on the wrong side. Uh, I, uh, we moved from the black side over to the white side, and I was then convicted for sitting on the white side. The sheriff came in and passed out weapons to seven Ku Klux Klan prisoners to beat me up while I was there. I'd only been in town uh, about a week. Oh, my gosh. That's, uh, well, skip that through. Um, on my 21st birthday, uh, priest Jonathan Daniels was murdered right next door in Lowndes County by Deputy Sheriff Tom Coleman, right in broad daylight, point blank with his shotgun. Well, kangaroo court, a jury of his peers. Uh, he never spent an hour in jail I, I haven't heard that all night. Uh, he never spent an hour in jail. Um, and they had a trial a month later, and his peers said, hey, you're a great guy. Isn't that cool? Your sister is the head of the school board. Um, eyewitnesses were not allowed. Many eyewitnesses saw him kill the priest with a shotgun this close. Um, but that's okay, because 
he was on their side. That's how kangaroo courts work. And um, uh, uh, he he never spent an hour in jail, and he was uh, he was uh, declared innocent by a jury. Uh, kangaroo courts, no witnesses, no documents, no evidence. And I thank you. And let me one one other thing. Um, the person who calls himself president spoke yesterday at Davos World Economic Forum, and he said nature is stupid, and he proved it by speaking. Um, he was followed by a world leader, a little girl from Sweden, Greta Turnberry, um, who just turned 17. She said nature is brilliant and beautiful, and she proved it by speaking. And um, Trump said the children uh, cause, are causing it. children speaking panic about nature are dangerous. Um, Nature, cut it, burn it, dig it, drill it, sell it, kill it. Greta said, our world is burning now. Our home is on fire. Do something now. Thank you. Thank you, Strider. So that concludes our forum. And forgive, forgive me for, I, I didn't cut people off tonight, so I figure, I mean, so. All right. Um, Council comments, anything? Uh, I assume nothing from city staff. So, all right, we have a motion. Joan Peck. Or do Actually, I? One, oh, one sorry, fast go ahead. comment. Um, I'm asking everybody when you're walking at night, please wear some light colored clothing. We have, everybody's wearing dark hoodies and jeans, and it's really, really hard from dusk on to see people crossing the street. So, that's just a personal request. Put on some lighter clothing. All right, any objection to adjourning? All right, I'll second that. Anybody object? All right, we're adjourning. All right.